Oh, hello there, Grand Raps. Welcome to my world. Hi, Bruce. Hello, baby. I just got chewed out by my producers. Where are you? I'm sitting right here. How far can I go? Well, it's early in the night. You'll That's true, and he's young. What a, <laughs> what a disease to suffer from. <laughs> What's on your mind, sweetheart? Well, I'm a little nervous, and I'm speaking from a completely naive place in, in space and time. Oh. So I hope you'll be gentle with me. Oh, my dear, I'll be so gentle. You'll wish you'd come back tomorrow night. Okay, well, I, I will anyway. I'm there every night with you. <laughs> okay, what's up? Well, I'm an artist, and I have just, I, the past couple of years, I've recently run into a client who I've done several projects for, and it's starting to take off very well. She's almost like a patron. She's a very wealthy person and likes my work. Mm -hmm. What kind I, of work do you do? Well, right now, the project I'm working on is a mural in ceramic tiles. It's, uh, I'll do anything that's not obscene. I'll come up with something that that she thinks is beautiful, and I really like to work on and put a lot of detail, and, and uh, it's important for me to do a good job for her. Mm -hmm. And so it's, right now it's an oriental mural for her new bathroom. Sure. I had done one for her kitchen, and the contractor who got me the tiles, the raw tiles, um, and did the installation, uh, paid for the firing of the tiles for that project. So I assumed that the, it would be the same situation with this bathroom project. When I turned over the bill for the firing um, of the first section of the project to the contractor, she said um, that I should turn it over to the client. The client and I had agreed on a price, which I since found out is pretty low, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I'm learning, um, uh, for a, a set price. Should I expect to be paid the set price and then also give her the bill for the firing on top of that? Mm -hmm. I have no idea how to handle the business part. Well, let's, let's, let's go back a little bit. Okay. So, was any discussion made of the firing? No. All right, let's 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 look at it from the from the from the customer's perspective, all okay. right? She wants a bathroom done and blah 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 blah, right? Right. What does she know about firing? Nothing. The answer is nothing. So I don't see yeah, she was quoted a price, is that correct? Yes. Unless the price was was it broken down in some way? So much for paint, so much for like I don't think so. No, what I usually you, do is she and I go half go half and half on the cost of the materials. Well, is that what you did here? Um, that's what I will do with the cost of the paints and everything, so should firing be included? In well, the thing is, that was it discussed? She no. she anticipates the, the paint, uh -huh. but did she, I mean, she had no knowledge of the firing process. Right. She did ask who had done the, uh, who had taken care of the firing before, and I told her that the contractor had. I mean, who paid for, who, taken care of, what does that mean? Uh, well, the contractor went to pick up the tiles for the installation. Yeah, but, 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 that, well, how do we define taken care of is what I'm trying to get to. Paid for. Paid for well, the fire. That, did she understand that as, the, as the, the the definition? She and I both did. I, you know, she well, I'd go it. back to the contractor and say, how much are we talking about, by the way? We're talking we, about $300. And how much is the entire job? For the total firing? No, you said the whole, how much is, the firing was 300, right? Uh-huh. Of, of how, what's that, how does that bear to the whole? She told me she would pay me 2,400. One eighth. Uh-huh. Tell you the truth, I think that you got to work that out with the builder. Okay. I don't think that you go back to the client. You, you quoted her a price of 2,400 bucks. Right. That would seem to me that's a delivered price. That's what I thought too, but it's going back and forth with these people who know business. Well, that sort of gets caught in my throat. Unfortunately, then you learn. How old are you? I'm 40-ish. Well, you're old <laughs> enough to know that. Yeah. I've, uh, well, see, I've never been in, like, the business world. I'm not well, a wheeler it's, 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 that, it's that time. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't assume anything. Let's start with that. Oh, I, I have one other question, though. Yeah, but let's, but let's understand that, that, that facet of business. Yeah. You cannot assume that delivery is included. You have okay. to discuss it. You have to. You have to assume that if you have, is, it, is it delivery to a platform or delivery indoors? These yeah. are. These are. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh. If somebody's delivery, if with certain uh, products you order, yep, delivery is included. 
That means delivery up to the front door, but the guy doesn't help even take it off the truck. Well, you got to know those things, otherwise you go broke. Okay, go ahead. All those bases. Well, she's talking about after this project, setting me, she just mentioned on the phone, you know, setting me up in some sort of a business of well, doing this. She said, I'll keep you working. And, she's, you know, she's happy with the work. I have no idea what to expect. I don't well, even know if I should what to ask for what, to what do you have to lose by discussing it with her nothing <laughs> so discuss it and then you say let me think about this then go home and run the numbers 16 different ways uh -huh. i do wish you well dear thank you sir hang in there we'll talk again well let me see from grand rapids we go to bradenton florida hello there hello bruce hi uh bruce i was in work when this happened and my neighbor witnessed it and what happened was that it was one boy pulled up with a car and he had three of his friends with him and they sprayed some graffiti's work on my van. And my neighbor took the plate number down and reported it to me and I reported it to the sheriff and they they got it definitely that the kid admitted to doing it. Well, why did he do this? It was on a dare between the other three kids in the car with him. Lovely. So, and how old the boy? I don't even know. I haven't met him yet. I haven't met the father. I just had a conversation on the telephone with him. What, the, what, was this, what was the result of the conversation? Okay, uh, the total damage is four hundred dollars, and I, uh, you know, of course, uh, the sheriff told me if he doesn't pay, we could press charges. But he agreed that he would pay one fourth of it. And he said the other people are willing to pay the other fourth. Now I don't even know who the other people well, are. All you say is look. It's 8 o'clock, whatever time of night. I'm going to give you 24 hours to walk in the door with $400. I don't want to know about the other people or whatever. That's your problem. You go talk to them. Uh -huh. All I know is my damages are 400 bucks. If you're here by 8 o'clock, or make you whatever time you pick. With 400 in cash, the matter is closed. If not, I'm going to, come, I'm going to prefer a charge against your son. Okay. End of story. No negotiation. Don't call me back with 398. Don't tell me it's 48 hours from now. Don't tell me the other guys are coming on their own. It's not my problem. Your kid's the kid who did it. We got you. you oh, have yeah, to. Well, no, 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 I'm no, no. We're talking about what you are going to say. Oh, yeah. You say, your kid did it, and we got you. I don't want to hear about anybody else. I want my money. I'll give you the tomorrow afternoon at whatever time. If you don't show up with the money, then we're going to prefer charges. We're still coming after you civilly. But we're also going after your kid. Okay. I do wish you well. Thank you. I'll tell you one thing. If that father... Hey, let me ask you this. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. What did the father say about the kid doing this? Did he... Did he, did he well, first, this? he denied it. He, he denied it to the sheriff that the car was... The car was in the driveway because this was... As soon as it happened, uh, the sheriff came here to my house promptly. I was in work and... Uh, mm -hmm. my so wife now that they, after they caught the kid, did the father say, I'm going to raise hell with his kid or well he told me on the phone that he was going to ground him with the car he did say that to me hmm. but uh he, the father didn't initially say that it wasn't his kid because the car was in his driveway and then the sheriff confronted with him well i'll be right over i want to i want to talk to you uh -huh. and then the father <laughs> says well not now and uh, then he came back and he said well, i'll give you 24 hours of call mr you know yeah, call yeah, me yeah, back yeah. okay the father then is as guilty as the kid. The father should come down that kid like a cloud. He owes that to his kid, but probably doesn't even understand that. Good luck, guy. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Top Guys. No, I don't think it's true, but they say that's true, and mm -hmm. so to keep from soaring, I stay awake and I listen to Bruce. Oh, my gosh. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> well, it's, I'll tell you, you know, you're really a fisherman. Yes, sir. You know, I, I, I asked a guy yesterday. This is gospel truth. I have a crab trap or, you know, a big old commercial crab trap in back of my house. Right. You know, I, I live on I the water. I think about that. I live on the water here. So. I know you do, and I've heard you talk about it. Yeah. Well, my, my mouth water. <laughs> I, don't, I don't fish. I have nothing against fish. That's good. Uh, my grandchildren, I understand fish, but they have a catch and release program. <laughs> <laughs> they they got to let it go. See, they live on a lake. and so oh, That's forth. good, too. And my, my grandson is coming here. Anyway, I, I went out yesterday to buy one of these uh, holding, it's not a trap, it's a holding tank. You, you, you grab a few crabs today, you put them in the tank, right, and drop it back in the water, so when you're ready, you can pull them out, and you got crab on the hoof, right? Right. So far, so good. 
And I said to the guy, you know, from th like yesterday, there were two or three pretty good sized fish in my crab trap. And uh, my neighbor said, well, don't let them go. Use them for bait for more crabs. <laughs> you know, there's, these are fish eight inches a foot long that get into the trap, right? Yeah, it's Florida for you. Yeah, so I said, is it different elsewhere? That doesn't happen? I'm serious. The crab, I guess the fish kind of were. Oh, sure. For the bait. Sure. Okay, but I said to the guy, well, how do I kill these fish? Oh, you just flip them up uh, out of the water and let them die. Now, you know, that just bothered me. No, no, no. No. That bothered me. Sit there and let something sure. die slowly like that. No, I'm a, I'm a catch and release fan. I also kill and eat. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you kill and eat, then you got to do it humanely. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm going to kill it for bait. I don't have any problem with that because, yeah. let's face it, the chicken that's in there isn't real happy about being bait either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't kill him. He came out of the freezer. But the point, you know what I'm saying. Sure. But 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 it just seems to me there must be a better way than just letting them gasp for air. Oh, of course. A little club. Hit them on the head, is that it? Oh, yeah. Or right. stab them, maybe, or something? Yeah, wrap them. Pretty good. It's, hmm. uh, it's the only humane way to do it. Hit them on the head, huh? I believe in that. Yeah, I, I, it just seemed to me, throw them up and let them... That didn't set too well with me. No, no. And he looked at me like I was absolutely squirrely. <laughs> you know, like, what's wrong with that? <laughs> like, does it matter? Oh, you don't you don't have to do what everybody else does. I don't. Well, he was running a you know a fishing place, you know where you buy equipment. So oh fishing. sure. Oh well, you get kind of uh, numbed to the. I idea, suppose I that's true too. But okay. there's a lot of us out here that don't do. Well, you see, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm doing all this mental thinking. At the same time, I'm eating beef stew. Yeah, sure. Uh, no, sure. I, don't think the, I don't think the cow was very happy about becoming part of my stew either. Uh, reason's got to play a part in it. There you go. What's on your mind, guy? Uh, my wife and I usually take a trip uh, sometime in Jan later latter part of January into February, mm -hmm. and we uh, like to go places that are kind of unusual. So far, we've been going to places like uh, halfway in Seattle. Missouri, halfway in Missouri, yeah, <laughs> and play unusual right. places. We got to leave here. What is what's unusual about Seattle? Well, no, I don't want to go to Seattle. I want to know what Alaska is like in February. Cold as hell. Well, of course. I mean, oh well, that's it. It's cold. Well, it's but cold and it's dark. Isn't, isn't that a part of the whole deal in Alaska? I've never been to Alaska in the wintertime. I've been threatening to do it. I'm going to Alaska on the 28th of uh, June. I'm running a cruise to Alaska. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to that. I have never been there. I was invited. I, you know, I don't know, several years ago, to uh, be part of the Iditarod. Uh, sure, not, the, yeah. not, the, not the ride the sled, don't misunderstand me. Right. Uh, but the scheduling didn't work out happily because it was a very cold winter that year. <laughs> uh, and it was, you know, one of the, when the tires were freezing to the ground and so forth. <clears throat> but I'd say go for it. Uh, well, now, there's not a, a whole great deal, I think. That, well, let me put it another way. The, a lot of the things that the traditional tourist would do that I would recommend are simply not available at that time of the year. Uh, there's one place, I, I, I'd tell you the name if I knew and I'd forgotten, but anybody in Fairbanks can tell you. There's a, um, a restaurant, bar, where, uh -huh. they, where they read Robert's Service and that kind of stuff. And it's about sure. 25 miles in the middle of no place. Like when I went there the last time, Big John from the Gold Ridge picked me up in a helicopter mercifully. I didn't have to ride back on a bus. But uh, <laughs> uh, among other things, in the middle of winter, right? Right. They have an outhouse race, which I think that must be a hoot. You know, they put outhouses on, on wheels and they push them down the street. Yeah. <laughs> which, which I think, and this place is in the middle of nowhere, and it's all lit up with Christmas lights all year round, and the people were as friendly as people could possibly be. It's just well, a tavern, yeah, and uh, that's certainly different, but I don't know if I'd want to travel 5,000 miles to, to experience it, you say. Summer's better. Well... On balance, yes, I think uh, Alaska in the summer. Well, Alaska in the summertime is, in fact, one of my favorite places. I mean, to, to sit along a river, uh, as we have done, and I forgot the name of the restaurant. It's a very, it's just a, a very nice restaurant where you can, you know, grab burgers and stuff. Yeah. At one o'clock in the morning, and the sun is out, and people are water skiing. That's that's kind of a hoot. That is a hoot. And uh, you know, you take take the river boat up the river with Discovery, which is runs out of. Uh, Fairbanks or a Big John's Gold Dredge and nice thing. He has another place downtown now, the El Dorado Mine. Uh, there's just so much to do. That's just in Fairbanks. And, you know, you go over to Juneau, and, which is the state capital, which is peculiar because there are no roads to Juneau, which maybe makes those politicians pretty smart. Well, there's no roads to halfway either. So. Uh, 
No, oh, come on. <laughs> there, there are no roads to Juno. Did you know that? The state capital? I heard that. You can only get there by water or by air. I did hear that. And I think that's kind of a, maybe those guys are real cool. But, the, you know, Sitka and Skagway and the rest of these places are Nome or are really uh, the Prince William Sound, Glacier Bay. Um, oh, golly, they just, the list is endless. Yeah, right. If, if you haven't, have you not been to Alaska? Never. Put it on your hit list. Oh, i got to go, and I want to go in the summer and fish it. Well, that's another story, too. I mean, they, sure. the, the, uh, if you, again, depending upon your, your uh, bankroll. I mean, if you're able to afford somebody to fly you in on a float plane to some of the more remote places, they tell me, for a fisherman, you think you'd die and went to heaven. That's what I want. Well, you can do that, too. Yeah. I'll do mine on a cruise ship. Thank you. <laughs> I also did, a, I did the rest of it as well. I mean, I've been to, you know, walking the glaciers and the rest of it. But uh, if for, for somebody who's never been there, uh, the cruise up that inland passage uh, is just... I can't think of a vacation... That you would enjoy more. It just, That's it, it. I'll try. One of, the, one of the things they have done in Alaska, there's a great series. You know, how many times I've been there? I, I can't even count anymore, right? And I stayed up at 2 o'clock in the morning watching Discovery the other night, right yeah. before last, because they had this stuff on Alaska, yeah. like Tracy Arm, places that I have been. Right. And one of the things that, that they have managed to, well, I don't even know if it was managed, but well, however, is so much of that area looks like it looked when man first got there in other words it, it has been, it hasn't changed 10,000 years ago yeah the, the well the, obviously the the glaciers and, and whatever there's been top uh, topography changes by by virtue of nature right but i mean it's just unspoiled i was flying somewhere i've forgotten where to be it doesn't really matter in the commercial jet right mm -hmm. i had to get on the phone and call some friends from the plane and just share with them what I was watching. It was so magnificent. Yeah. And that doesn't happen. I'm pretty, 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 you know, I, I, I don't get impressed easy. I guess that's what it comes down to. Takes no, but you've impression. been impressed by Alaska because I've heard you talk oh, about it a lot. Of it time. is just so magnificent. It you really bet. is. The, uh, and the people are as nice as any group of people. You're, you're going to find stinkos like every, but as a group. Right. The people are as nice as any group of people that has ever been my privilege to meet. And that's a fact. I do wish you well, Guy. Thanks. Hang in there. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Hey, Denny and I are hanging out tonight for an extra hour. We are indeed. We'll be taking your calls off the air, laying them on tape for broadcast at a future date from 10 to 11 p.m. Trying to catch up a little bit so I can travel next week. I'll be going down to Austin, Texas, to KLBJ Country. Yeah, we're going to do the program live from KLBJ Studios Thursday and Friday. And I understand the limited number of you will be allowed to drop by, so... Listen to their morning and afternoon shows, and they'll be very happy to tell you how you can get tickets to drop by and we can get acquainted. That's Austin, Thursday and Friday of next week. I think that's the 18th and the 19th. Alrighty, let me see. It's Hermantown, Hermantown, Minnesota. Hello there. Bruce, how are you doing? I'm doing real well, thank you. That's good. I've got a question for you. I hired a construction company to blacktop my driveway. Mm -hmm. Signed a contract with them, and uh, they put me off for about a uh, month and a half or so. Why do you suppose that was? Oh, they were backed up. I would, I would assume, due to rain, weather, and whatnot. When, when did you sign the contract? What time of the year? Uh, the date on my contract shows uh, May twenty third. Okay, right in the springtime. That's a good time for asphalt. Yeah. I assume uh, it's asphalt, right? Yes. Okay. They started work on it, did, came in and did all the dirt work, site preparation work for it on October 31st. May, June, July, August. Boy, you a patient guy. <laughs> there was a lot of phone calls in between, believe me. What, what about about two phone calls from me? I'd say goodbye, go away. <laughs> did you give them any money up front right away? Yes, I did. 10% down. Another mistake. Okay. Maybe 10% maybe when they showed up on the job, but not, well, go ahead. Okay. Well, they came in October 31st and did all the dirt work. That's the 1st of November. <laughs> You're in Minnesota. Yes. That's when winter starts. Yes. Well, November 1st, they shut down for the winter. They're, they're completely done. They don't do anything else, no matter what the weather, if it's decent. Well, it's probably because the asphalt plant shuts down. Yes, they, and they have a hard time with uh, the cold joints and stuff like that. 
they came out and they screwed the whole thing up and then they, they said, well, I'll see you in the springtime. Well, they just did the dirt work. They didn't do any of the blacktop work. They just I, did, what, what I'm trying to get to is, well, well, maybe let's start again. Was this a brand new driveway? Yes. Okay, it wasn't replacing something. No, they came in and dug the, it was basically virgin soil. They took out 18 inches, brought in a fabric, oh. and then packed it with class five. All right. Okay, so they did the dirt work. Packed it with what? Class five. It's the material, dirt-wise material that they use up in this area. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, it's a mixture of clay and gravel and rock. Okay. And they finished that up, said they would come back in the spring to do the, black, the asphalt, which yeah. I didn't have a problem with, I guess. Being that you early. really didn't have a problem with that. I'd have been orbital. <laughs> no, not really. It, was, it uh, wasn't... You're in no hurry, huh? No, not really. I didn't. wasn't exactly happy about having a bunch of mud in my yard in the next spring again. Boy. No. You you were a nice guy. <laughs> but oh, go ahead. No, let's see. About last month, or uh, well, about uh, 15 days after they did the work, they sent me a bill for the dirt work, and I just kind of disregarded the bill. I, well, good for you. I didn't. I figured, well, I gave them 10 percent down with contract saying the balance due upon completion. How much was the whole deal? The whole deal was 3,600 dollars. Right. How much was the bill they sent you for? The bill they sent me was uh, fifteen hundred. Go ahead. Uh, I disregarded that first bill. They sent me another bill saying they wanted it paid, and they also added on twenty dollars service charge for each month that I haven't paid it. And I' not exactly happy about you know paying for something until I wouldn't it's completed. consider paying them. Furthermore, I wouldn't ignore the bill. I'd get right back to them. I did call him say, back. Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. <laughs> okay. Man, you're a very nice guy. I mean, I would I would have sent them a very testy letter. What the hell is wrong with you people? We gave you a job in May. You come in here the last day of the season. You you destroy everything and dig it up, and now you want to get paid for that? You got to be kidding me. You're lucky I'm going to pay you at all. <laughs> That's what I tell them. All righty. I mean, that's absurd. I, you know, I, this whole scenario is absurd. The reason why I stuck with the company is I, I've seen their work. They've done my parents' driveway, and the price was very reasonable compared to other estimates I've got. So yeah, well, you, the with. cheapest is not always the, the, the least expensive. That's, I suppose, true. Well, not as you suppose. It is frequently true. So I wouldn't give them a nickel. Furthermore, I'd tell them you're lucky I don't sue you for non-performance. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? Uh, I, I, I couldn't know. be I more just, serious. I just, I just thought it was, uh, I, they were busy and uh, they were trying to run a company. I figured, well, they'll get to me when they got a chance. Boy, I, I hope I, all my customers are as nice as you are. <laughs> I wish you well, guy. All right, thank you. I wouldn't much. pay them a damn penny. Not a copic, not a ruble. Till the job was absolutely perfect. And then I'd probably want a discount for all the inconvenience. I'm Bruce Williams. Love to hear from that contractor. This is Talk Test. Let's go to Sunrise, Florida. Hello there. Good evening, Bruce. Good evening. I am a tax accountant, and presently I advertise my tax return preparation services in the yellow pages. And this year I'm thinking about running some spots on radio, in particular during a talk show format. Hmm. How about a talk net show? It's even better. Well, oh, actually, I'm thinking about your show. Well, that's the only place to be, of course. Yeah. Right. Might as well go with the best. And, Absolutely. Uh, and I'm just wondering, do you think this would be cost effective? Uh, huh. Basically, I'm right. um, appealing towards the middle to upper middle con individuals. Here's the problem with any advertising venture. You got to figure out first of all where your ducks are. I mean, if you want to go duck hunting, uh, trust me on this one: the desert is not the best place to begin. Would you agree to that? True. And for, and before you begin that, you got to know what a duck looks like. Agreed. Okay. Now you start to describe your duck, middle income, certain age, and all that sort of good stuff, right? Right. Well, certainly those are uh, among those people who listen to talk radio. If you wanted to sell a pimple medicine, I would tell you this is not the place. Right. Because that's just not the audience that's going to be, they aren't smart enough to listen to what we do. A few kids do, but they aren't smart enough just yet, you see. Now, the only way to find out if radio, if at radio or any other kind of advertising is going to work is to try it. And that doesn't mean one spot or two spots or five spots. 
if the station will take that few spots from you, they're just taking your money and they're making a big mistake. Yeah, I've heard you mention that before. Oh, it's true. And you've mentioned in your book, I was thinking of running a spot every day, five days a week for about nine weeks during tax season, starting about the middle of February right through uh, the middle of April. I would have started start tomorrow. You tax season, well, the, the, or the people that you're looking at, tell me if I'm wrong. The people that you're looking for, a significant number want that tax return as quick as they can get it. Uh, a fair percentage. All right. Well, those people are the guys who are beating their employers' brains out. Give me a W-4. Give me a W-4. It's not due till the 31st of January, as we both know. Right. But, they, I mean, I have people working for me. Hey, can I have my W-4 now? I want to get my return. Well, those people are, in, in the middle of February, you lost them. Right. However, with the more involved returns, uh, generally yeah, the paperwork filters in later. You know. I, that, we're not going to disagree, but then right. I'd, adver I'd advertise earlier for the people that I just described. Yeah, I certainly and, agree with you about, you know, repetitive, repeating the ad. Yeah, and, and the ad should be about the same. You don't want to try to have 10 different ads that you're going to run. No. One, one or two at the most. And I'm just should, figuring on one. They should have essentially the same message. Right. And what do you think I might want to include in the ad or poss make, possibly omit? Well, we're back to the ducks again. What do okay. ducks eat? Okay, well, as I say, I'm looking for uh, people who are middle to upper middle income, possibly small business owners, investors, people who own real estate. And basically, my premise is come to me and I'll help you save money, reduce your taxes. Well, that's it then. Yeah, and that's, what, that's what I plan to show in the have well, read in the well, end. But that's what you're saying. Right. You, you say, look, uh, my name is Harry. You might even want to do this about yourself. My name is, is John Jones. I'm a tax accountant. I've been one for a number of years. One of the things you can depend upon is that the tax laws are constantly changing. What was appropriate yesterday may very be very well be inappropriate today. Well, my whole life is dealing with tax stuff. Now, I can't promise I'm going to save everybody money because it's entirely possible there's no help for you. On the other hand, you're never going to know unless you let me go over your return. I'm a professional, and I do the job right. As a matter of fact, if in the unlikely event that I make a mistake and there's a penalty, I'm responsible for those mistakes. Is that a good deal? I think it is. Why not give me a call? I just did a commercial for you. It's the way I would do it. And I believe in using professionals, and I believe in radio. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Mess. I mean, they, you read their reports and, and you think that the house should be demolished. Well, that's stupid. Well, it's only a three-year-old home. But regardless of that, there are, there are inspectors out there that will show you. When they get done, you'll think you'll get the bulldozer out. Oh, wonderful. And, they, and because they feel that they, they've got to, to earn their money. And I don't. But that's not what I would hire them for. I want to know where this, I want to know the situation. I'm with you. In other you. words, I don't, I don't want them to tell me to replace the heater. I want, I want to know that the heater, in their opinion has so many years left in it not the fact that it's 15 years old and therefore is beyond its useful life because we all know that there are cars that are 20 years old that are running better than cars that are two years old well, that's right that's, i, that's I have I'm, one now there you go that's what i'm paying for you see the other thing is on the home inspection uh aren't they supposed to like if they say there's no termites and there are termites aren't they responsible Customarily, the house inspector doesn't do the termites. A termite guy does the termites. Ah, well, let's say. And yes, if, if they certify that the house is termite free, then they have responsibility, yes. Because uh, several of the ones that we spoke to, they said they don't guarantee anything. Well, but and the most of them, and not most, many companies will say that. And that's, I don't care who it is, including anybody I do a commercial for. That's not true. Ah. It's nice to put a disclaimer on there, but, but let's face it, it doesn't mean a damn thing. That's what I would have wanted. Well, here's the thing. You hire, in this instance, a house inspector, or you hire an attorney, or you hire a physician, or an accountant, whatever. You're hiring an expert. Yes. To do something that you don't do. Now, they don't have a right to just say, well, okay, uh, you're hiring us, but if we screw up, too bad for you. That just isn't the case. You are hiring them as an expert, and if they blow their expertise, then you have recourse against them. Very an attorney, good. If an attorney screws up, I'm going to sue the attorney. If a doctor screws up, I'm going to the doctor. Now, screws up in the case of medicine is not the same as screws up in the case of a plumber. 
<laughs> no, I mean that sincerely. In other words, because somebody dies, it doesn't mean the doctor screwed up. Uh, very, very, very valid. He could do the best possible job, and the patient could still die. If the pipe still leaks, the plumber screwed up. Correct. I wish you well, guy. Thank you very much. And a good I'm Bruce Williams. Thank you, my friend. This is Talk Pass. We go to Walla Walla, Washington. Hello there. How you doing, Bruce? I'm all right. I always think of that. There was a comedy routine about Walla Walla. <laughs> Town they like so much, they named it twice. There you go. What's on your mind? Okay. Um, I recently got a pamphlet in the mail, and it basically stated there was this gentleman, can't mention his name, that uh, says that you can make money on the futures market, commodities market, and uh, he's going to guarantee this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you take his three month class, which yeah. is which is a book, mm -hmm. okay, and he gives you the materials to play money and everything and you actually play the market for three months, uh, from how it states and uh and that he, he guarantees that you make money. Suppose you don't. Suppose you don't. That 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 was my question to you. <laughs> he guarantees you make money, suppose you don't. Okay, he's pretty says, pretty elementary says, question. Okay, well he says that you can get a hundred percent refund. Well isn't that nice? I'll tell you what I'll do. You like to gamble? Uh very limitedly. Uh, you ever played a horses? Uh, I have before, yes. I will guarantee you one hundred percent that I will give you a winner. What track do you like? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Pick a track. Uh, it's operating now. Belmont Stakes. Are they Belmont. Right? Well, Belmont the Stakes. So is Belmont open now? I don't know. I don't think I so. I believe it is. All right. Let's assume that Belmont's open tomorrow, all right? Okay. I will positively, absolutely guarantee you I'll give you the winner in the third race. How are you going to do that? Do you think I can do it? If Probably you don't, if, not. If, if, well, if you don't, you get your money back. If I don't give it to you, get your money back. Well, that sounds great. Does it really? If I get my money back. You'll get your money back, guaranteed. If, if you know, would you pay me $1,000? I don't care how much you bet. You can bet a dollar, you can bet 25000 doesn't matter to me. I'll give you 1000 bucks. You give me 1000 bucks, And if, if I haven't given you the winner, you get your money back. That doesn't make sense. Well, sure it does. I'm never going to miss. I'm never going to lose. Oh, well, you can't always win. I don't have to. I'm always going to win every race. Yeah, I'd do it. Well, you'd be a sucker. Here's the way it works. Suppose there are eight horses in the race, right? Okay. I'm going to get eight guys. Each of them give me a thousand bucks. Okay. You get horse number one. He gets horse two. The other guy gets three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One of you guys is going to win, aren't you? Correct. I'll keep your thousand dollars. The other seven guys will give you a thousand bucks back. I get a thousand bucks ahead, don't I? That makes sense. Ooh, it makes sense, but it's hollow sucker. <laughs> Do you see how it works? Yeah. Well, you can do the same thing, the same, assuming the guy would give you your money back, which I'm not sure is true. But you can do the same permutation. I'll, I'll, I'll take five, 50 guys, 100 guys, and I'll teach them how to invest in the stock market. In the event that you lose money, you get your money back. Well, a couple of you make money. I keep your money. The rest of the guys will give the money back. I don't lose, do I? No, you don't. Hello, sucker. There are no possible way anybody can guarantee you you will make money in any market endeavor. Now, there certainly are courses that can help you invest and take some of the hazard out of investing. I don't think anyone would quarrel with that. And, you, and, and an educated investor has a better shot than the non-educated. I think we can agree with that. Okay. But if that guy knows how to beat the, the, the commodities market every time, he would be certifiable to share it with you. Right. Huh. Well... Geez, I, I don't I don't really understand the futures market or the commodities market. Well, I, don't, is, I don't know how it works. Well, I, listen, I have no quarrel with you, uh, and we, I'm not going to give you a, a, a whole discourse on commodities and futures here. Hillary Clinton might be able to do that. She did pretty. She did pretty good. <laughs> but but yeah. I, and I should even say that. That's I apologize because that's probably history now. But the point being, you'll hear advertisements on the radio for uh, speculation commodities. 
might have heard it on this program. Not in my voice, guaranteed, but you might have heard it, all right? Right. That's sucker stuff. Something in the order of 70% of all people that invest in commodities lose. Do you understand why these markets existed originally? They were set up so that farmers could hedge and guarantee they would get so much money for their crops. If the crop went up in value, they had to sell it for less than they might have in a free market, but they could guarantee they're going to get so much money for their crop. That's a that's an oversimplification, but that's what it's all about. Right. People are, that are speculating wouldn't know a cow if it's stamped on their foot. And if he told them he told them beans, they'd be looking for something green, you know, in their pot. They wouldn't know what soybeans are. Right. Just, so, as, just as you got guys betting on football pools that wouldn't know a football if it hit him in the head. The point is that that these are are highly sophisticated crapshoots. But no matter how you slice it, they're crapshoots. I, I I had to laugh. I'm sitting here listening to the radio. I was listening to a New York major talk station in New York. I wasn't sitting here. I was sitting in my automobile waiting to get through the Lincoln Tunnel, would you believe? You could spend half your life doing that, <laughs> which is why I do the show from home. I don't, I don't go to New York anymore. Okay. But in any event, I'm listening, and here is this guy flacking heating oil. Get in quick. Heating oil is going to go up. If it only goes up a nickel a gallon, you can live in a Taj Mahal and take $5,000. It'll be worth 50000 And so you've heard those commercials, right? Right. Okay. I'm listening, and I, and I know this is bull, you know what. But then comes time for the on-the-hour news. And what do you suppose the lead story in the news is? Heating oil just went down eight cents a gallon. Right. <laughs> if you'd have bought that position two days before, you'd been wiped out. Wiped out. And then they'll say, well, silver only goes up a dollar. When was the last time silver went up a dollar? It goes up in pennies. Right. It's not dollars. Gold goes up in dollars because of the relative value. Right. Silver doesn't go up. It may. The point is that this is speculation, man. You can you could have as good or a better shot at going to Las Vegas and playing the don't pass line and laying the odds. <laughs> there you only got about four tenths of one percent against you. That makes sense. Now, if this guy, but, if this, but even there, you're gonna lose. Yeah, if this guy prints and a guarantee that you'll get your money back, then he has to abide by that. Is that not correct? Boy, I, I want you to check your chest right now. Does it got sucker tattooed in four or five languages on it? No, it doesn't. Hell no, he doesn't have to do that. He could be eating Brazil nuts on the, on location two weeks from now. If he goes broke, what happens? If he runs away, what happens? If he runs out of money for refunds, what happens? And I tried to explain to you a minute ago how I could run that same ad and give the money back. Right. Because right. I, I tell six different people to do six different things. One of them is going to score. You like football? Yes, I do. I will guarantee you the winner in the Super Bowl. How's that? Guarantee you. You'd be a rich, rich. No, man. no, no. You would be a chump. Yeah. Same is the same. Look, don't you understand the scenario I just described to you? Yeah, yeah, I understand well, that. Well, let's go back to the Super Bowl. I'm going to pick both teams. One's going to win. And one's going to win. Thousand guys. I'll get a thousand guys over here on the one side. A thousand on the other. The thousand guys that I don't give the winner to, I'll give their money back. Right. The thousand that I did, I'll keep the money. How do I lose? So your suggestion is to not venture into something this risky. You've got to be. No, it's not a question of risky. There's no risk here. You're guaranteed to lose. Don't you understand that nobody has to send circulars in the mail if they actually, if somebody finds um, the ability to turn base metals into gold, they don't have to share it with you. If somebody finds the fountain of youth, trust me on this one. They are not going to have to advertise on radio and television. People will find them. This is sucker stuff from beginning to end. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Night. Hey, Danny and I are going to be hanging out tonight till 11 o'clock. Between 10 and 11, taking your calls off the air at 800-743-8000. I do hope you are encouraged to join us. Fayetteville, North Carolina. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. Hi. Bruce, what city did you grow up in? 
Oh, golly, a number, but I guess if I had to blame somebody, it would be East Orange, New Jersey. I guess that would be the, if I've ever grown, that would be probably the, that was the elementary or junior high and high school. Well, it just seems uh, through your uh, wisdom, you learn at a young age not to trust everyone, uh, well, which I assume was from growing up in an urban area. Oh, I grew up on a the street, no question about that. I, I was, I was a, a street hustler from the time I was 12. Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, yeah wrong, I, I, is there something wrong with that? No, no, nothing at all. I just, just, uh, 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 I grew up in Chicago, and my first job I ever had was delivering the Chicago Sun Times for a man we finally referred to as Jake the Jipper. <laughs> and I can still remember, you know, 30 years ago, I can still remember going in the alley and all the other little paper boys telling me the first day on the job, watch out for Jake, he'll cheat you on your collections. Mm -hmm. Now, I, you know, I'm not that smart, and I was just a little kid, I don't know whether he was cheating us or not. But I know I didn't make a whole lot of money on that job. He probably did. <laughs> you, you don't get reputations like that undeservedly for the most part. Yeah, yeah. What are uh, you, but you learn, you see. You learn from people. I mean, there, there's some people that I learned from who have uh, been the subject of books. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. And some of them have, have uh, been the denizens of some of our better penitentiaries. Yeah, yeah. Which is a whole other program. Yeah, some people just haven't had the... Uh, uh, you know, people who are too trusting, they just haven't had the opportunity to have those experiences. Well, I, I mean, you're, you're, I think you're talking about the last the last caller. Well, not him in particular, but people like that in general. Yeah, well, there are people that are, are less suspicious, I suppose. Uh, but, but I have always, I, I, I remember at a very young age looking for the hook. Figuring out what, you know, or this is what the guy is saying to me now. What, what is he really doing? Yeah, yeah. What does he, what, what he really want? What's really happening here? Yeah. Someday I'm going to tell some stories publicly that will shock some people <laughs> about my callow youth. But I, you know, I, I told them in, in private, you got to be kidding. You really did that stuff? I, yeah, I really did. But uh, I'm confident the statute of limitations has long since uh, freed me from any problem of prosecution. <laughs> anyway, what's on your mind? My question is, uh, you always say how you must have an attorney when you're purchasing a house. What about when you finally pay off a house? I have a rental house I'll be paying off in April. And it, I isn't, it, isn't, right. it isn't necessary. I have always just, hey, Nate, I'm paying off a mortgage. Make certain that the, the satisfaction is filed and get me the papers. And he charges me a nominal fee. I just don't do things like that myself because I'm, I'm always aware of the fact that if you screw up, it can be very expensive. If there's nothing that you couldn't do yourself, I would not. So it would be good to get an attorney, make sure the title and everything. What did I just get through saying? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I mess around not so much as I used to with property. Now I'm kind of in, a, in more in a selling mode than I am a buying mode. Although I'm probably going to buy a couple now. But the point is that uh, I'm selling, I'm selling a piece of property in, uh, I guess, a week or two. I hope the closings come off in a week or two. I have nothing to do with it. Literally, I'm not going to be there. I have nothing whatever to do with it. I, I believe in letting professionals uh, do what they do. You know, I don't I don't fill my own teeth. I don't cut my own hair. I don't do my own taxes. I do what I do well and allow those people that I mentioned and many others to do what they do well. Okay. I, I, I would prefer I'd be I'm just more comfortable when uh when somebody does it that way. I mean, if, you, if you can look at it from a little bit different perspective, it's an insurance policy. Because if he fouls up, I have recourse. If I foul up, I can just kick myself or I don't get a headache. Right. And I've done that so often, I'm telling you, I'm, I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, yeah, I've kicked myself enough times too. Yeah, we're, we're talking about a, a, such a, a small amount of money, I don't think it makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, the money wasn't really an item. I just... Uh... Well, really, I just wanted to uh, thought of something I could ask you. Well, I, I appreciate your call. <laughs> Congratulations on the mortgage, kid. Hey, uh, God bless you, Bruce. Thanks a lot. We'll do it again. We go a little further south now from North Carolina to Charleston, South Carolina. Hello there. Hi there, Bruce. How are you? I am just fine, baby. Well, I need your wisdom on something. Um, I got an advertisement through the mail for a tax magazine and I wanted to see what your opinion would be on it. Uh, it's, it's a small investment, but um, well, I don't want to wake up in the morning and see sucker tattooed on well, my forehead well, either. Well, on your forehead. Huh? we got away from the chest here because it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, never mind. 
Uh, I have no problem with things of that kind. I mean, let, let's assume that 99% of the magazine is a waste. Mm -hmm. If 1% has some value to you, you got a bargain. True. As I see it. Uh, do you do your own taxes? Yeah. Okay, well, I think that, depending on, on your circumstance, I think that's a mistake. In more cases than not, if, if you're thinking about buying a magazine on taxes, then I think it's a mistake. Well, I'm, I'm a little skeptical because it says there's over 400 legal loopholes that um, can keep your money hidden from the IRS. So well, I, I'm, you see, I'm, that, that, that's a statement that, that, that you could probably make. Uh, there's, when you say legal loopholes, there are a lot of things you can do. Mm -hmm. And you can dramatize it by saying hidden from the IRS. Um, on television, I haven't seen it this year, but there is a, an infomercial for a tax magazine. Mm -hmm. And guess who did the infomercial? IRS? Moi. <laughs> you. Me, me, <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, it was for Money Magazine. Now, certainly that's a, a reputable time as a reputable corporation. I have no problem with that. Okay. Uh, but but in the, I think as and I haven't seen this thing. I saw it once after it was produced. But it seems to me one of the points that was made that I made was even if you're having a tax preparer, do your stuff. It doesn't hurt you to have your own knowledge, and I believe that because I am constantly looking over my professional shoulders mm -hmm. to be sure I and, and I'll catch you making mistakes from time to time, or or doing something that I think can be done a little differently and. I might be correct. Maybe my, my uh, instincts are good. Maybe they're not. But uh, let's let's do it this way. How much money do you earn? Um. Well, Come right now to... it's probably under fifteen thousand. In that case, you I'm, I'm trying taxes. to start up a business. So. All right. You're married, single, what? Single. Then that's the whole income, fifteen grand. Yeah, thereabouts. Well, no question. You you could be you should be able to do your own taxes. Right. I don't have any problem with that. And as a matter of fact, I don't even know if you need a book. <laughs> There's very little that you're going to pay anyway, if anything. Mm -hmm. But I have no problem. I, I, I have oftentimes said in, in stuff that I've written, 98% uh -huh. is no good, so what? To you. Uh -huh. That 2% is well worth the price of admission. Uh, are you a college graduate? Um, not quite yet. Okay, you went to college. Uh, yes. Would you... Uh, let's let's look at it, but I'm, I'm going to try to put it in quantitative terms. I don't know that's fair, but of the, all the courses you've taken, are they are they been all beneficial in your life? Um, you got to be kidding! You got to think I about that. I have to say, I can't think of one that hasn't been. To be honest, is that with right? You. Well, yeah. boy, you're way ahead of me, and I've probably taken a few more than you have. <laughs> there are a lot of courses that were pure baloney. Oh, I had a lot of stuff that was pure baloney. I can't think of one benefit I got, for example. I remember this, I can date the day even, uh, when Alan Shepard went up into to space as a suborbital ride. Mm -hmm. Miss Rogers, God bless her, I'm sure she's no longer with us, told me I'm going to flunk, and she would, that was my, I was graduating that year, and I wasn't going to graduate if I cut her class to watch, to listen, because they'd been watching it. Anyway. And I said to her, you know, that, this, that the class was classical music. I figured Bach has been around for a long time. He'll keep it tomorrow morning, Miss Rogers. No, no, no. And I said, this history is being made today. We're going to be in space, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I cut the class, and I listened to Mr. Shepard take his ride. I, I met him subsequently that time. Uh, I can't think of one thing I got out of that course. Yeah, I have to agree with you. <laughs> okay. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is that if, you, if, if the truth were told, we could probably go through a four-year college program easily in two years if we could eliminate the stuff that really had no value mm -hmm. the troublesome part of the equation is what has value to you may have no value to me and what has a lot of value to me been totally worthless to you so we have to be exposed to all these different things True. in order that we can sort things out do you, do you see what i'm trying to get to yes i do uh, I wonder if I can ask you one one quick question. Uh, hmm. I have a couple of uh, stocks that I uh, one I per, I got through a company that I worked for. Um, I'm not real up on stock market, and and I really would like to know if there is a good place to start learning. If you can suggest a good book. No. No. Well, I suggest a lot of periodicals though. Such as. We mentioned Money Magazine before. 
money. Okay. Money with the Wall Street Journal Fortune. Uh, is that easy to understand? I mean, I always. Uh, well, wait a while. I'm not suggesting that you read these things like you read for a course that you were going to have a test in. Mm -hmm. You glance at them. Uh, on the floor, about a foot and a half from me right now, is the is the is USA Today. The number two section is the one green section, financial section. Mm -hmm. Now, if you put a gun to my head, I couldn't tell you everything was in that section. But I glanced at it today. I glance at the journal. I glance at other things. You pick stuff up a little at a time. We're not talking about uh, a crash course, I don't think. Well, I'm trying to understand if, well, I'm trying to figure out whether or not the investments I have are, are really making money for me or if I should get rid of them and, and well, get something we, better. Well, you see, you've asked three entirely separate questions. The first one is, are they making money? That's an easy question to answer. Just take a look at it. Is it making money based upon its current value? That's easy. Is it going to do better or worse? That's tough. Should you change? That's even tougher. You've asked three tiers of questions there. But the uh, the, the only way that I know to, uh, to handle the, 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 is to get a gradual education. Watch uh, the, the financial channels on television from time to time. But the magazines and the periodicals, I think, are the best place to begin. And, of course, if you can find the time, nothing wrong with taking a course at a junior college or at your local high school adult education if the, if the time permits. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Grand Rapids, welcome. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing real well, thank you. Oh, I can think of nobody better whom to ask this question. I just graduated with my Bachelor of Science in Meteorology, and I have an idea of approaching some radio stations I know of that don't have any weather forecasting positions open, but I don't know how to approach somebody to make a new position like most, that. Most of the stations do not do that. They subscribe to a service. The service may do a hundred stations. I, I I think you'd be hard pressed to find anybody that has their own in-house uh, meteorologist at the, at the in the in the radio business today anywhere. Mm. There there are 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 specific forecasting companies, and they do very narrow forecasts. You know, they'll focus right in on you know Jonesville that kind of thing. And as you well know, you could be in California forecasting for New Hampshire without any problem. You're getting the same satellite data. It doesn't really matter where you are. And with the uh, uh, capability of things like I'm using right now, the Switch 56, uh, they can sit there in their studio, and the guy will do a forecast for New Jersey, and then he'll get right off the air. The next forecast is in Ohio, and the next one he's going to be getting right back on. Two seconds later, he's talking to Bangor, Maine, whatever. That's the way it's done today. I don't think you're going to find the radio station with an in-house meteorologist. It's just too expensive, and it's not. It's just not. Doesn't make any sense. Well, there are several stations in the area I know of that, though the, although the meteorologist is not an in-house meteorologist, they have one meteorologist. They call a staff meteorologist. Yeah, but that guy could be thousand miles away is what I'm trying to tell you. Okay. But and you don't know it because you're coming. Like right now, you and I are talking, right? Yes. My producer is a thousand miles from me. <laughs> the guy that you just spoke to, Danny? Yes. He's a thousand miles from where I am. Now, you have no way of knowing that, do you? Not really. And you're, and you're in at, at Wood Radio, right? You're up there in Grand Raps, okay? Yes. I'm certainly, uh, I'm guessing, 1,300 miles from you. Now, there's no, can you tell the difference between when I'm talking and your local announcer is talking? Not much. You know, not I mean, much. You can't tell at all. And I'm telling you, that's the way the, fork, the radio meteorology is done today. It is done through companies that, that service 50, 100, 200 radio stations. Now, if I were to approach, or how would I go about approaching, radio, say I, I didn't want to be an in-house meteorologist, but I wanted to start my own radio weather forecasting. You've got to set up, you've got to, you got to sell them 
on what you're doing. And oftentimes it is not sold, it is bartered. In other words, you get paid in commercials, which you then have to go out and sell. Okay. And you also have to be able to provide what they consider to be accurate forecasting. And the way you do that is empirically. You, you'll forecast for three months or four months, and they'll take a look and see at the end of that four-month period. Well, let's see how this guy did. Okay. But the chip, but your best bet, since you're just a recent graduate, would be to try to get a job in one of these companies. Okay. And I'm sure your 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 uh, uh, department head ought to be able to help you out with who they are. But that's the way it's done today. It's done through centralized companies that specialize. There may be an isolated station somewhere out there that has its own staff meteorologist. I can't imagine why they would, because as a practical matter, these companies can do it cheaper and they can do it better. Hi, right, Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Let's go to WCOL country, otherwise known as Columbus, Ohio. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. Thanks for taking the call. Oh, I'm glad you're here, Kai. What's in your mind? Well, a year ago, I bought a new car, and I got a lemon. Mm -hmm. Started uh, transmission problem, power window problem, uh, alternator, so on and so forth. Um, and so after many months of talking with the, uh, with the manufacturer and sending letters around and so on and so forth, this very evening, they have called me and said they would like me to uh, to bring the car back to the uh, local dealership here where i didn't buy the car there but they're the ones that have attempted to do most of the service on it mm -hmm. uh, they said bring it on back up here we'll uh, go ahead and take that on a trade-in and we're going to give you uh, twenty five hundred dollars in a trade allowance towards uh, towards buying a new one Wait a minute. how old is this car um a year and a week i bought and it they and they only want to give you twenty five hundred for it um they're well they're for my for my time and trouble oh Supposedly. Well, well, maybe I'm missing something. They're they're going to um, appraise the car and take it, buy it back from me, basically, whatever the fair market value for it is. Basically, uh, you know, what you would trade the car in for. Oh, okay. That, that's got to be more than $2,500 for oh, a yeah. well, car. Oh, yeah. Well, they're going to give me $2,500 on top of... Over and above. Yes. Well, that's not such a bid. How many miles you got in this car? 21,000. In a year? Yeah. What what are you what, what kind of drugs are you pushing or what are you <laughs> Well, I I moved from from another part of the state and I ended up having to to commute for uh, for about a month. I see. Oh, a month. At that's a lot of month. miles. That's a lot of I mean, even though the the car was giving you trouble, apparently it didn't give you so much trouble you couldn't drive it close to 500 miles a week. Well, that is that is true. A lot of those were put on early in its life. Uh -huh. Well, they're going to discount the, the clearly the uh, the mileage you put on there and there's a couple of ways that can be done. You could start with a the price that you paid for it less so much a mile, mm -hmm. or in the alternative, just go to the uh, the ADA book and come up with a number. But the twenty five hundred didn't seem bad price to me. Well, the, the, I guess the thing that kind of disturbed me was the fact that I have to actually go, um, you know, go through the process of buying another car. I have to go and you know negotiate off the sticker price and mm, well, and uh, pay the taxes what, again. And, and well, no, wait a minute, hold on. You don't, you don't wait a minute. You, you, I think in most states you get credit for the amount of sales tax you paid on this car. You only pay sales tax on a difference. Oh, really? Yeah. Most states, I believe, are that way. Hmm. I'll invest. If, if you're trading in a $10,000 car that you've already paid sales tax on, you only pay sales tax on the difference, I believe. Hmm. I could be mistaken. I know there, there are states that do that, whether yours is progressive. <laughs> I'll have to check that out. That way, I don't know the answer to that. But also, I mean, it also forces me to, to buy another car from, from this dealer who, well, who I may or may not be so enamored with. Well, this is all very true, but this is not a perfect world either. And so, uh, on balance, it doesn't sound to me like a bad deal. You know, look, there, you might be able to, it's rather like any other, any business transaction. Maybe you could squeeze another nickel out of it some way or other. But usually, in my experience, it's better off to get it out of the way. It doesn't sound like a, a, an unreasonable thing. They're paying you something over 50 bucks a week for your trouble, and which is not a, a bad number, it seems to me. Good luck with the new wheels, guy. Don't forget, kids, we'll be here from 10 to 11 this evening, taking some calls off the air. I hope you join me. Thank you for this hour. I'm Bruce. This is TalkNet. All this time, you're going to travel and you're going away. Don't try to economize for 30 cents. Right. It doesn't make any sense. And, and for crying out loud, don't go to McDonald's or Burger King or someplace. <laughs> uh, there was a restaurant that used to be right by the bridge. 
uh, in Nassau. It was called the Over the Bridge Inn, which is a pretty decent restaurant. It is now a, a franchise. And the franchise ain't bad. I've eaten in their store, and I would continue to go to one in New York City or someplace where I'm, you know, just looking for something to eat. But I most certainly wouldn't travel that far on a vacation and go there to eat. It's a rib joint. Or at least the last time I was there was a rib joint. Who knows what it is today? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. If you're going to go all that far, go to a good local restaurant. Why would you want to eat in a damn hotel? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, that's well, well, going here. well, when you travel, I mean, have you traveled for vacation before? Oh, yeah. Well, did you eat in hotels? No, not really. That's absurd. I don't care how good the food is. You can always eat. Now, you can go to, if you, if you want to eat in a hotel, go on downtown Goldsboro. The same food. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's the same food. Right? I would imagine so. Of course it is. If you're going to travel, for Pete's sake, take advantage of the traveling. And part of that is to go to some local restaurants. And you may be disappointed in some of them. And the service may not be too swell in others. But that's the way you find out. Okay. I mean, goodness gracious. And I really think I'd think that one over a little bit if I were you. If you're going to go to the... For the first... There's nothing wrong with the Grand Bahama, by the way. Mm -hmm. Not a thing in the world wrong with that. And as I said, I've been there and I'm sure I'll go back. But there's very little to do, I'll tell you that. Very little besides going to the beach. Well, that, get, that's, and, that's, that's the big reason we're going. Yeah, but you can only be in the beach all day. Then what? Your batteries are all charged up. You've been laying around doing nothing. Now what? I don't know. I reckon we could lay around and do some more nothing. Well, if that's you, okay. <laughs> that would drive me crazy. There are two casinos, by the way, in the Grand Bahama. There are uh, casinos on Paradise Island as well. Well, you heard what I said. If I was choosing the Bahamas, first time would be the Nassau area. There's far more to do. Okay, well, we're going to look at some packages for that tomorrow then. I'll I wouldn't look it. at packages. You wouldn't? No, sir. Told how, would, you that. how would you do it then? I would get an airplane and I'd get a hotel. Hmm. And I'd go strictly European plan, which means you get a hotel room. I wouldn't want to have to be met. You see the problem with this? I got to turn you loose. So you wouldn't stay at it, you wouldn't stay at a resort, You'd stay at a hotel. Oh, absolutely. Are you talking about one of these these like like a club med or whatever? Yeah. Ah, no. No. There's nothing wrong with those places. Please don't mis don't misunderstand me. But if you've never been here before, you want to go out and do things. Who wants to be locked into one place? I most certainly would not. Not at all. I want to be out doing stuff, seeing different things, things that I can't see at home. I don't want to have to buy. And the problem is, if you pay for the breakfast and pay for the dinner, you'll feel obliged to eat it. That's what it comes down to. I'm Bruce Williams. Stick around. This is TalkNet. Let's drift over to Terre Haute, Indiana. And I should remind you, because I haven't done so, we're going to be here tomorrow evening from 6 to 7 Eastern, taking your calls off the air for an hour before the show, as we are this evening, one hour after. Your turn. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. How are you doing? Steve? I'm very, very well, thanks to guys like you. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, hear you every evening on the, on the radio. And uh, I guess it's a service to us that are uh, not as knowledgeable in financial matters that need a little uh, boost or kick in the butt every now and then. To hear I don't know if I, you know, I don't really think of myself as doing a financial program. I really don't. I think I do a show It's pretty much about life as you and I have to live it, not as personalities and then the stars and the, have to live it. Oh. How come our lives are so much different from theirs, you know? They're worried about it. Can we get the caviar delivered for the big party, see? I don't know. That's, uh, uh, that's what they get I, for living out in La La Land, I guess. I've never had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> What's on your mind, guy? Well, I'm uh, 40 years old, and uh, over the years, I've done a pretty good job of getting my and keeping myself in debt. And uh, I guess I've learned a long and wrong way of uh, how to go through life. And now, since I'm kind of at a crossroads, I want to try to get myself back on kilter again. What's the crossroads? Well, the crossroads is that uh, to get oneself out of debt doesn't mean getting oneself into debt further by... Uh, <laughs> getting into more credit cards and oh, what you're talking about is maybe getting some uh, taking some bad habits and, and and getting rid of them and maybe learning some good habits that's it all right let's talk a little about you married single what single what do you earn a year oh i'd say um 15 16 thousand what do you do i'm in sales what do you sell uh well i'm in the uh, relocation business moving Oh, you sell moving? Uh, moving services. That's a pretty tough racket, isn't it? 
Well, it is. It can be. It's uh, uh, it can be cutthroat from time to time. But uh, I guess whoever's got the sharpest pen and can. Uh, How long you been in the business? About fourteen years. And, and you're still only making three hundred bucks a week. Uh, well, that's uh, my base. But depending on what my sales are, if I uh, do well, uh, you know, like it can be better. What did you make in 1994? The years over? Uh, I'd say over 15,000. Well, you're, that's 300 bucks a week. Yeah. Yeah, last year wasn't all that great. Isn't there something else you could do to make a little more money? Well, apply myself at what I'm doing. Uh, well, that's, that's certainly one answer. How much are you in hock for? Um, 12,000 total. Be still my heart. That's over a year's take home. I know. About uh, 4,600 of that is, uh, medical bills uh, from a uh, surgery I had about a year or so ago and the rest of it's uh, charge cards and, and such. Well, you're not going to like the message, my friend. Well, I, if I didn't think that was going to be worthwhile, I guess I wouldn't have called you. So. Okay. You're going to, you're seriously, you're working five days a week right now. Right. You have to start working seven. I mean that very sincerely. It means getting a good job on Saturday and Sunday. Uh -huh. And every single solitary penny that that job brings in has got to go to debt reduction. Otherwise, you're never going to get off from under. Ever. Never. What's your opinion on uh, on non-for-profit credit uh, accounts? I think they are very, very good to use. I have no problem with that. Whatever. I recommend them highly. Okay. But that isn't going to help you in and of itself. That's you know it would let, let let's kind of draw an analogy if you if you break a leg, mm -hmm. uh, it's very I'm not gonna tell you it's impossible but it's damn hard to walk with one crutch. You need two. Can we agree on that? Sure. All right. Well, you need two. The crutch of the of the nonprofit credit counseling agency that can help you negotiate with your creditors and whatever certainly has a great deal to recommend it. But the other crutch you need is more income. Right. And you're only going to get that by breaking your buns on Saturdays and Sundays and nights. And if you're healthy and whatever, I'd say get a second job at night, a full-time second job. You could be off from under in a year and a half, two years. Piddling around with, with the income that you got now, you're going to be old, gray, and retired and not be off from under. Well, I'm partially serious. gray right now, but... Uh, well, the gray is, 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 you know, editorial. Who cares? Right. I don't care if you're... You know, you, we, we can't tell... You can't call you bald anymore. <laughs> but that's not politically correct. No, it's follically challenged. <laughs> I see. Anyway, what I'm suggesting is you get another job at night and bust your buns and every dime goes to debt reduction. But by all means, talk to the nonprofit guys. At the very least, they might be able to get the interest rates negotiated down for you. They can do that? Not always, but they can certainly do it better than you and I can do it. Yeah, because that's what they do. Okay. It's not going to be easy. Well, uh, I didn't think of, uh, there's nothing easy about getting out of debt. There's and, nothing uh, easy about unscrewing up when we screwed up. Well, that's uh, the, true. The, the, I the, guess the... Uh, trick is in realizing that you screwed up well that's identifying the fact that you got a problem is half the battle you're absolutely right you know the guy says oh, i don't have a problem i don't gamble too much and then he goes down and, and loses his paycheck that morning at the track or the casino or whatever or the guy who staggers home every night i don't have a i can quit drinking anytime i want or the guy who's 380 pounds and i don't have a problem with eating i can stop and go on a diet and lose any time as he stuffs in 19 hamburgers and 44 fries those guys are in trouble. The first thing you got to do is identify the problem. And that's tough. Because you're right. talking to God. You know, let's face it, pal. I've had to identify some of those problems. All of us have to. Uh -huh. Facing ourselves is not an easy thing, is it? Well, I just as soon endure uh, a hardship for a short period of time than go through a lifetime of well, misery and frustration. More important, the, 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 uh, the real test is when you look in the mirror... Do you see a man that you can be proud of? Right. 
That's what it comes down to. I agree. I do wish you well, my friend. Thank you, Bruce. We're going to Lansing. Hello there. Welcome to TalkNet. Hi, Bruce. Thank you for taking my call. I'm very pleased that you called. What's going on? Well, first, I have my two-year-old son here, so sorry if he doesn't get If he starts giving us trouble, look out. (laughs) What's happening? Uh, We are building a house, um, me and my wife. Uh, The builder is a famous, well-known people in town. Um, we have paid $100,000 in advance to start construction and um, um, uh, for the lot. And uh, in 10 days, we have to close and pay another $150,000. With the house is finished? Uh, the house is pretty much finished. But uh, tomorrow, we meet with the builder about the potential problems that we have. Mm-hmm. And um, one, I I'm, I'm myself a structural engineer. I beg your pardon? I am I'm a structural engineer myself, and right. I think the house has a basic problem, though many things are done properly. Uh, what, the, is, the, what is the basic problem that gives you concern? The slab, the, the basement slab, was poured on wet uh, soil, and thus it, is, um, it, is, it has some settlement, which is showing in form of uh, rather wide cracks. Oh, in the they're not going to close. How in the world did they convince you? How much is the lot worth? About $60,000. How in the world did they persuade you to give them $100,000 up front? Well, 60000 for the lot and about, uh, about forty fifty thousand dollars to start construction. Well, are you a physician? Oh, you said you're a structural engineer. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well... But the, the, I don't know. Are you represented by counsel in this matter? But uh, that me maybe I represented the problem not uh, quite properly. The soil was wet. Uh, I understand that. And you poured, they poured concrete on the soil. It had, the, it had and, rained. And the soil, the, the, now the soil, because it wasn't stable, yeah. uh, the, the foundation is cracked. Exactly. Now, well, I don't know how, if it's cracked to the point where it's, it's, a tra- it's, it's troublesome, it may have to be replaced. And that's a very expensive venture. Exactly. Are you represented by counsel in this matter? Do you have a lawyer? Uh, no, I don't. you got to be kidding me. You're spending a quarter of a million dollars. Let's talk about a one quarter of a million. That's like two and a half hundred thousand. And you're not represented. How come? Um, well, he trusted the, the builder, actually, because he's, he's I wouldn't well. care if the builder was my brother. My brother, I wouldn't trust him that way. But anyway, the situation is that the cracks are wider than, uh, in, uh, according to their warranty, reaching that width, they have to do something about that. The situation is this. rather vague about that. Well, let me explain something to you. Here's the situation. Yeah. That you're on the hook on a contract for a quarter of a million big ones, and they got $100,000 of your money right now. Yeah. You got a deficient, uh, defective property. Yeah. Which may or may not be repairable. Yeah. Uh, reasonably. Yeah. And you're and you're walking in there with nobody to help you but you. Yeah. That is the shady side of insane. Now before you go talk to this guy tomorrow. Okay. If you're smart, you're going to go out and hire yourself a lawyer to be right there holding your hand. Okay. Now, I don't know how this. Pro- I mean, you're. What would you say it's going to cost to correct this problem? These 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 cracks it, it, and stabilize the basement so it doesn't happen again. You know, it is it, it, it is very difficult to say without testing. Well, but the tests are going to have to be run then. And you're going to have to sit down and talk to someone who uh, specializes in this. And there are companies who do specialize in stabilizing unstable foundations. It is not cheap. And depending upon the soil configuration, a whole bunch of other variables, uh, whether or not in fact it can be accomplished. But in the meantime, in the meantime, you're on the hook for a contract for a ton of money, a contract that you don't want to complete. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Peru. Hello there, Peru, Illinois. Hello, Bruce. How are you tonight? How are we doing? You know, our next call is Athens, Ohio. I said, if he comes up with Rome, Georgia, I'm walking out of here. What's on your mind? Um, I have a question about life insurance. Um, I'm just starting out. Um, I got out of college uh, four years ago now, I guess. Three years ago, excuse me. And I've been working. I'm married. And my wife and I are expecting our first child. Oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, My question is, the company that I work for, I have life insurance that is approximately one and a half times my salary. but that's temporary. Pardon me? That is temporary. What do you mean by that? 
you fired tomorrow, the insurance goes oh, the next yeah. day. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean right. by it. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, the company that I work for, I have salary, life insurance, which is exactly one and a half times my salary, mm -hmm. um, which with two people, myself and my wife, that's pretty good, and I wasn't too worried about it. But with a child coming... Oh, wait a while, wait a while. Let's okay. back up. How much do you earn? I earn between, I'm in sales, I earn between 25 and 36,000 a year, depending well, see, on how... You see, $50,000 with life insurance. Right. right. Something like that. That's... that's very, very little. Okay. Okay. But for just, I figured that amount is going to be enough to cover the expenses for a burial. And yeah, it'll do that. It'll be a high-class funeral, as a matter well, of fact. Well, sure. But, uh, <laughs> you go out a big way. Yeah, and my wife, and, you know, we discussed it, and that we felt was adequate. I don't disagree, because she could, she's still working, and she can earn a living. and Correct. Whatever. Right. Okay. With the child on the way, she is going to um, quit her job. We both discussed, and we want her to stay home and raise the child. And we feel very important about that. But with the child here, I also know that I'm going to need to increase the amount of life insurance that I carry. Well, in the event that something were to happen to you, that's true. Correct. And I want, I want to know the difference and what you would recommend between term and whole life. I've heard varying opinions, and I just wanted to get your opinion. Well, in your case, I'd recommend term. Principally because you can't afford very much whole life. Mm -hmm. It's a very practical proposition. I mean, you're, you're doing okay, but you aren't rich for having money. Right. And the, the purpose of that you have described to me somewhat obliquely, but nonetheless, you want to take care of things if you're not in the picture. Correct. You're not asking to save money. You're not looking for a retirement program. You're no, simply not at all. okay. Then term insurance is, would, would accomplish the mission. The question is how much. And I would think, do you smoke? No, not at all. Okay. Good health? Yes. You're 20 what? 25. Yeah. You could buy a half a million dollar term policy or next to nothing. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. Is whole life as an investment plan something that is a good thing to look at? Well, that's a, we could, that could be discussed at another time. That's a, uh, there are certainly is a place for whole life. And there is also, uh, there's, there's a case to be made that there's other things you can do with your money, and we're not going to settle out here. Mm -hmm. the, the first, your first question, I think, is far m more important just now. Mm -hmm. You want to provide for your child and for your wife if you aren't in the picture. Now, there's another part of the equation that you didn't address. How much insurance do you have on your wife? My wife has a policy she has through work. Well, which she's leaving work. She's leaving work. She doesn't have anything then. Well, what happens if she dies? Correct. I, well, I need well, it. well, what happens? I mean, I'm asking you a question. If she dies? Yeah. Right now? When she no, dies? not right now. After you've had the troll. After <laughs> the troll. Um, I, I need something to cover her, obviously. Well, forgetting, yeah, because if, never mind covering her, it's a question of you're still going to have to provide uh, some kind of child care and whatever for the child. Right. Is that not? Yeah. Well, that, that's a big gap. Uh huh. So I would think that you want to think about some uh, maybe a family term policy or some insurance on her, okay. certainly at a minimum. Okay. If you, if, let's assume you want to dissipate the money, okay? Mm -hmm. In other words, just when we need it till the child is in school and so forth. Right. Sixty-five, seventy-five thousand at a minimum on her. On her, and then what did you say on me? A half I would think you can buy a half a million. You say. This comes as maybe a surprise to a lot of people, and it's not always true. First of all, it's, oh, I, I should have mentioned this before, all insurance is not created equal. In other words, if you go out and say, I want to buy a, a dollar's worth of life insurance or a dollar's of term, we'll say, for this, to say this discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Go to 10 companies, you're not going to see the same quotation. Right. Some will cost more or less, and you want to shop. Right. About and to see what's available and so on and so forth. Now, what I started to say was, in some instances, if you, it's let me let me give you a, an example that has nothing to do with this at all, but I think you'll see the relevancy. All right. Mm -hmm. this, 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 these are the kinds of things that blow my mind. I remember asking a girl that worked for me. I said, "Look, I got to get out of here on a pick a day, Wednesday afternoon. See what you got. Or maybe a little before noon." Okay, Mr. Williams, tap, tap, tap on the computer. Okay, I got you covered. It's going to, you know, the flight's going to cost you $933. You're going to hear there and there, right? Right. I call the airlines. That sounds like a lot of money. Well, if you took the 10 after 12 flight, it would be 400 and some odd dollars. Whoa, it's 900 and something at 20 to 12, 400, 10 after. I'll take the half hour. Now, what's wrong with that equation? I asked the wrong question, didn't I? Mm -hmm. What did I ask? I asked if there's a flight before noon. 
Well, it's not dumb and stupid. She asked the right, she went to look before noon. She never looked at 10 minutes after 12. Now, you walk in, you say, I want to buy $425,000 worth of term, right? For right. the sake of discussion. The guy or the gal may very well quote you a price on that. But if you'd asked how much is a half a million, it might cost less. They may have a package. So you don't ask, you ask, you see what I'm getting to? Yeah. Yeah. You got to ask the right question. Right. If you, don't you get, you get the, the, the appropriate answer for your question, but when you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer that's appropriate to you. Okay. And that's, that's a, a lesson in life, let me tell you. Do you think that the larger, I don't want to say any names, national life insurance companies have more pack, or they're going to have more packages to offer, but financially, <laughs> Are they going to be better if I use their off with them than a not regional necessarily. company? Not necessarily, no, not at all. Okay. Uh, I would want a company that is well rated by Standard & Poor's and or Best Guide, B-E-S-T. Okay. Right. Okay. I do, I do wish you well, guy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining. Good luck with it. I, I said troll. You got, How about calling it a crumb snatcher? How's that? <laughs> That's fine. I do wish you well, kid. Congratulations. I'm Bruce Williams. Oh, reminding you. Tonight, Danny and I are going to be here between 10 and 11. And tomorrow, an hour before the program, from 6 to 7 Eastern, we'll be taking your calls off the air. To either one of those times, I'd love to hear from you. This is TalkNet. The home of WATH, Athens, Ohio. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. Thanks for taking the call. You're very, very welcome, Guy. What's on your mind? Well, I'm, I'm looking at purchasing a bar and getting into that kind of business. All right. And I know you've, you've got some, and uh, I figure you'd be the person to call and give me some advice. Well, what would you like to know? Wanted to know. I I don't have the money, so I'd be looking at tying in some investors. That's pretty tough. That that's what I wanted to get more information about. Uh, where are you planning on getting these investors? Well, I've a friend of mine. Uh, she's got a couple people lined up that are willing that have some money to invest. What kind of a deal are we talking about here? How much money? Let's start with that. About three hundred thousand. You're buying an existing joint for three hundred. Yes. Mm -hmm. What What is it doing a year? Uh, probably about six fifty. All bar? Excuse me? That's all bar? Uh, yeah. No food? Exactly. Mm -hmm. How about entertainment? Um, no, none. None at all? Just, yeah, just the bar. I'm kidding. That's not a bad gross for just a bar. No entertainment, no, no, dis no DJ, no nothing? Well, yeah, you have, you have a DJ and a dance floor. Well, wait a while. That's entertainment. That costs. <laughs> well, going to the bar is entertainment, too. Well, no, I'm talking about, <laughs> that may well be the case, but going to the bar, you're going to have to write a check to pay the DJ, and so that's what I asked the question on entertainment. Okay. And you also have to pay a check to ASCAP. Right. The, the BMI. Mm hmm You know that? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. It's grossing six and a half hundred K. Is there any real estate go with this? What's the business? It's um, the building, uh, the business, all the equipment. Hmm. How big a place? Oh, I want to say maybe about... Uh, 4,000 square foot. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good gross. Why are they doing so much? It's well, it's, it's one of the only bars that has um, 18 and older and dance floor. 18? Yes. How can you let 18 year olds into a bar? Well, they're, they're ID'd all the time. So how only 21 older can drink. How do you prevent the 18 year old? I'm serious now. It's, it's, they're, they're How do you all, prevent the 18-year-old from, from getting a drink from a 21-year-old and he's got a, they both got a Coke in their hand? How do you know which one has the rum in it? Well, uh, got about seven bouncers that what are all, you know, monitoring everything. What was that uh, little bit of noise there? Danny, did you hear that? No, huh? Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I, it, it's something to look out for, but... Boy, you bet that part right. <laughs> When you're dealing with that young a crowd, but I mean that's but that's where a lot of your money comes from at this particular place. You know, okay. two dollars a head to get in the door, and yeah. you know, it adds up. Well, no question about that. I talked to somebody about a place that does that tonight. I wouldn't have any part of it. Really? No, sir. Uh, you, even though you know the potential to make some money is there. Yeah, but the problem is you get your license on the line every time you open the door when you got eighteen year olds around, nineteen year olds around, twenty year olds around. Uh, you're sitting there, you can put ID bracelets on them and tattoos in their forehead, but how do you stop them from handing a beer to an 18 year old inside the club? Right. How do you prevent that? How do you know when a kid's got a glass in his hand that his buddy hasn't poured a beer into it? Uh, well, I mean, I'm just from Art? sight. What's that? I'm just from sight and constantly making oh, around. You've got to be kidding me. No way. There is no way to control that completely. Just can't be done. How do you tell water from vodka? Tell me. By sight. You can't. 
That's right. How do you tell gin from water? Can. How do you tell a, a cola with or without alcohol in it, or any anything that's brown, even iced tea for that matter? Uh, how, do you, how do you tell? How do you tell a fruit drink that's laced or not? Well, well, you don't serve any other types of fruit drinks or anything. Well, but, but you see what I'm getting to. Yeah, oh, well, true. I tell you, listen, I'm not telling you shouldn't. Go ahead from there. I mean, I'm just, well, that's I just would, have, that's... would have no interest to me, whatever, just be on that basis. True. Sooner or later, you're going to get it busted. It, it, it happens. You, yeah. did, does this place carry liquor liability? I'm, uh, I'm not exactly sure. It's called Dram Shop Insurance. And what is that called? Dram Shop Insurance. What's something like that, Ron? Yeah, for a place like you're talking about, maybe a thousand a week. Uh, and that would little cover less, such. Maybe, um, a little less. That would cover oh. such things as far as underage or what? No, no, it certainly doesn't. It just covers if they get in trouble. Okay. Not doesn't cover your license. Right. Well, one of the things I want to know was what is, as far as if, if I'm talking investors, I what would be appealing to them as far as getting them involved with this? As far as well, uh, anything payoff. else, money. Um, How much can you afford to pay them? Uh, right. You're going in with nothing. Well, you can afford to pay a lot. The problem with that scenario is, which is, it, it gets a little difficult to deal with, when you go in with no cash, before you can pay back your investors, you have to pay taxes on the money. You got to pay with after-tax dollars. In other words, you take in that 600 grand, let's assume it nets out at, well, maybe a lucky two. I'm sorry? Let's assume it nets out at, nets out at two. Let's assume okay. it you get real lucky, all right? Well, you just can't go to your investors and give them the 200,000. You got to pay taxes on the two hundred thousand, which is going to be in that in the in that, in that example probably eighty to ninety thousand. Okay. Then you can pay them back with the remainder. When you start out with all borrowed money, the the, the tax impact is is horrendous. Okay. But then in, you know working off of that, then as far as feasibility, I could you know, draw something off. Well, how long has this place years. been? A, how long has this joint been in action? Oh, um, I want to say since six. Oh, okay. It's been doing that kind of volume all this time. Yeah. Well, listen, how, how do you knock success? I'm not, I'm not I mean, I, I have been, I suppose, but, uh, <laughs> well, I'd be, I'd, I'd be very, very, as I said, I, I had a discussion with someone about a place today. And I, I as God is my witness, I said, no way. I'm just on the basis I described to you. Right. That I didn't want, and, and they do the same thing. They, they, they do this 18 year old caper. I can see having a place for 18-year-olds with no alcohol. That's a different matter. Well, I don't even want to get involved in that, to tell you the truth. That's a lousy age. So I shouldn't look to you for an investor, huh? Well, no. No, I wouldn't touch <laughs> I mean, 18 is a lousy age. These kids, you know, they're, 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 their hormones are running and, and uh, they're difficult to control. How many places have tried these teenage nightclubs and, and taken it in the tank? Not because they couldn't get business, but you can't control them. Where you get 25-year-olds, you know, they've settled down a little bit. They still have a good time and whatever, but they, they're, they're, they're starting to be, uh, become real people. Right. Well, it's, it's the big thing here is it's college town. Yeah, well, but, college, you said college bars and college kids are tough. But 18-year-olds are even tougher. I mean, why do you suppose so many of these towns that, that have been do so well with the spring breaks are discouraging them anymore? Because the, the the benefits just uh, are are exceeded by the liabilities. Doesn't mean they're individually bad people. As a group, they can be difficult. If you can handle it, fine. Yeah. If you can handle it, I think finding investors is going to be difficult. Uh, Three hundred thousand dollars, and then you got to have. Is this an all cash deal? Uh, most likely. Then you got to have operating capital. You have to have capital for insurance up front. You'll probably have to have bare bones, fifty grand, to open the door. Yeah. You know, for inventory, for right. the rest of it. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, sorry, that, yeah. That's, that's why I wanted to call you. You know, get some ideas from you, some things I might be overlooking. Well, uh, the the big thing is, how old are you? Twenty five. Okay, There's nothing wrong with being twenty five and ambitious. I have no quarrel with that. It's a it's an the usually a deal like this. The money comes from the guy who has it now. Mm -hmm. He wants out and he finances it. Okay. That's where the money comes from. It seldom comes from outsiders, as you just, unless it's somebody who loves you. you know, your <laughs> parents, no, I mean, seriously, your parents got yeah. money. It's a different matter. Your in-laws, if you're married, that sort of thing. 
but it seldom comes from outside investors, particularly for someone like yourself, who I have to to guess has no experience in this business, other than working there so uh, a little bit. Well, if you, how long have you worked there? I've only worked there for a few months. Uh, what do you do? Uh, Ten bar. Well, you know how many ways your employees can steal, don't you? Yeah, oh. it, yeah. The potential is there in a bar. Easily. You've got to be kidding me. It's, it's Unless you've got a manager you can spot an overpour from fifty yards, you're in trouble. That's um, what I'm saying. Yeah, the, the potential is always there in a bar. I'm sorry. I'm saying the potential is always there in a bar. That's right. Yeah. And unless you know a lot about the business, that in itself could take you down. Yeah. That's what I'm getting to. It is not an easy enterprise. I think anybody in this racket will tell you. I do wish you well, kid. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talkman. Thank you for your patience, Kennewick, Washington. Hello. Hello, Bruce. Hello there. I, uh, you helped us get through college, my husband and I, and now we're out making some money and paying the student loan, and we need some advice. Let us talk. When do we need to have someone else prepare our taxes? We've been out for two years. And I don't know if it's when we hit 100000 or when we have a house or... Well, all of those things are certainly variable. So are you earning a hundred grand now? Oh, no. We're, we're at sixty. Well, that's okay. It's an important number. Yeah. How complicated is your life? Do you own your own home? Yes. Okay. Do you have any kind of outside income other than your, your, um, your business, your employment? No. No, we don't. Do you have any business expenses that are incidental to your employment? No, we don't. You guys all, you know, you both work indoors, so you drive there, you get there, and you leave. And that's it, yep. Okay, you don't clock have to buy in, any, clock out. any special uniforms or any of that nature. Not that aren't covered. Well, the, the long likelihood is that in your case, that the, the standard form will do it just fine for you. Oh, good. It's, well, not necessarily good, but it's, <laughs> it, it, uh, you, at 1040, you should be able to fill out by without any big problem. Okay. The only, it looks to me like the only only deduction you're going to deal with other than, and you have to work it both ways, is your is your interest on your home. Okay. And charitable contributions. Those are the only two we've had in the past. That I've well, charitable, what is it? Over, yeah, that has to be over, what, 4% of your gross adjusted or something? It's 10%. Or you tie ten percent? Is that what uh -huh. you mean? Right. Well, and then you might have a deduction there, but you see, it still may not be. It may not pay you to itemize. I don't know that. Okay. And nor, nor do you. No. But you can sit down and do it both ways and see which ways comes out for you. All right. And I, don't, and then, I, don't, I don't really believe that you're going to have to uh, to have anybody help you with that. Although, just to the heck of it, what you did for the first time around, or the second time around, do it yourself. Buy a buy a buy a manual. You can buy it in any bookstore. And do it yourself, both ways, right? Okay. And then hire a tax preparer to do it and see what he or she comes up with both ways. Oh, good idea. Now, now if they come up with the same number as you that you have and nothing materially changes in the next two or three years, then you just do it yourself from that point forward. Then we're okay. Yeah, but then at least you'll know. How do we find a good tax preparer? Oh, uh, the, the kind of thing you're talking about, you can go to any department store and you'll find somebody who will do the job for you. Okay. One of the chains, not limited to... But like H and R Block, that kind of a for the for the for the for the complexity you described, they can do I'm sure a fine job for you. Do they need to be a CPA? No, no, not for you're 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 pretty simple at this point. I mean, I don't mean you, your situation. As it develops complexity, that's a different matter. Hey, Denny and I are hanging out around here. We are indeed. We're going to be here for the next hour, but more important. Or as important, we're going to be here tomorrow between 6 and 7 Eastern Time, taking your calls off the air. So stick around, let's do it now, or tomorrow between 6 and 7. It's not easy. We know that. Give it your best shot. Try and do it right on Bruce Williams. Keep in touch. Find out exactly how it, you know, how it was put in there, under what tax laws. Uh -huh. And you have, to, you have to take it out of the company and take it elsewhere. Is that correct? Right. All right, but don't. In most cases, if you put it in your, even for five minutes in your hands, you got to pay taxes. Okay. So don't do that. Okay. Check with your accountant or an accountant and find out. He'll, he'll have to inquire as to how this profit sharing plan was set up, you see. Yeah. And then you may want to roll it over. Whatever you're going to roll it over into, it has to be rolled over appropriately or you get a big tax bite. I might have just saved you yeah, about seven, $8,000. What's your commission? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um. What can I tell you? One more quickie. Um, sure. No, I forgot what it was. Oh, the the 
the interest now is about 2% higher than when we borrowed on this house. Yeah. So now we're going to go up there and pay about almost triple in taxes and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we're at a 20-year mortgage, and I, I don't really want to go more than that. Is it Would it be like an unwise thing to say, well, I'll go up there and, and I'll get comfortable and get what I can afford on a 30-year and pay them interest rates? They'll, they'll be down again soon, and then I'll refinance. Well, that first of all, you got a bigger crystal ball than I've ever seen. Okay. <laughs> if you know that interest rates are coming down. Well, I don't know if they're coming down or not. I don't think that they are in the short term. Okay. I don't think anybody thinks they're coming down in the short term. Okay. Uh, but beyond that, you will get a better rate of interest on a shorter term mortgage. Sure. And if you had to press yourself a little bit, I'd press. Yeah. Right. Uh, I do wish you well, Guy. Thanks a lot. Take good care. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Pass. Huntington, Long Island. Hello. Hi, Bruce. Okay. Hello, baby. A couple of days ago, somebody had called. It was a man who owned a store, and he had hired his nephew a year before. And a girl's mother of a girl who had worked in the store found her diary claiming she had sex with the nephew. Yeah, yeah. And she was threatening him with a sexual no, harassment. No, she wasn't too. threatening him. She was. They were involved in a, a, in a sexual. They were su the, they, the family or the girl was suing the uh, alleged misprint and the owner of the business who knew nothing about this okay now you had made a remark that disturbed me a bit you said that the girl should be discounted because this complaint was being made a year later and that I if the complaint had been made immediately the boss could do something but if somebody comes back a year five years later whenever that that should disqualify them yeah i said that Okay, now the only thing is most people did think that way. In psychology, we found that delayed reporting is one of the greatest signs that any form of sexual abuse did happen. Well, I don't way. care if it happened. That's not the issue. The issue is how is the, the guy who's being sued supposed to do anything about it a year later? Unfortunately, though, that is part of the syndrome. What happens is that when somebody goes through something like this, usually right. they're embarrassed. That's tough. I don't mean to be unfeeling. But one of the, the basic tenets of Anglo-Saxon law is you can face your accuser and you're, it, it should be immediate. Unfortunately, you're, you're, no. but, but, but you are, how, how is the employer going to have any defense a year later, two years later, when, when people's memories have faded? People have gone away. Well, first of all, they can bring the people together. But usually Maybe. what happens where there's an allegation of sexual abuse, whether it involves a priest, a counselor, or anybody else, is that once one person comes forward, you find a lot of other people come forward. And frequently, those other people coming forward are liars. Frequently. In my opinion, we had that with a Supreme Court justice here a short time ago. Well, it could have been 50-50. I mean, we really well, don't know what happened. Uh, you're absolutely right. But I would trust... The chief uh, testifier against him, as far as I can throw a grand piano with you sitting on it. Well, we don't know what happened in that case, but the fact is when somebody comes forward immediately, let's say they work at a job and within a week they're saying that employee is harassing me, yeah. they are more often, believe it or not, to be the liar who's doing it to be vindictive or to try to win a lawsuit. Yeah, but let me, forgetting all that. How do you defend yourself when somebody pops up a year, two, or three years later? That's what I want. To and get all the people together. How does a doctor who sued for malpractice 15 years after? I don't think that's proper either. Said. I've said that many times. I think it's ridiculous, and I and I condemn attorneys who take that kind of work. Well, what would you suggest in cases where the woman, more often than not, is somebody with low self-esteem, who doesn't feel people will support them, and is afraid to come forward? In that and case, then... unfortunately, she's going to have to take herself out of it and let it go. But I don't think she, well, what is, well, let's go the other route. I've only got a couple of seconds here. Let's go the other route. How long should she be able to not come forward? In other words, I'm an employer. I've employed a lot of people and continue to. What if somebody comes in and says, 10 years ago, uh, your clerk, George, who I don't even remember, did something to Mary Jane and we're suing you. Now what in the heaven, first of all, do you have any idea what it would cost me just to start to defend myself? Why George should I be subject be the person to have to defend themselves? Yeah, but but in this case, they're not suing. They're suing George, who has empty pockets, and in the case we cited, the employer who has something in his pockets. Well, that is that doesn't seem fair to the employer, but that's well, a different issue. Not. We're talking about delayed no. reporting. No, that's no, no, the no, issue no. That I have delayed reporting. But the issue the was that the but the the issue was that the employer was being sued, who had no no knowledge of this a year later, and I'm saying no. 
if she brought it up at the time, that's a different matter. And if it's not at the time, is it a week, two weeks, a month, two months, two years, ten years, a lifetime? What? The statute of limitations on that type of crime is usually six years. Six years? Yes. Well, I, th I think that's absurd. I think that's patently It's that way absurd. with most crimes. No, that's not true. Most not, people that's, will that's report other types of crimes very quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't. I understand that, and I can understand the embarrassment and all the rest of it. But I, I still believe that you that 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 uh, a reasonable period of time, and that's then that's that should be the ball game. I know what you're saying, and I sympathize with the person who's been harassed, be it male or female. We have the new movie now on the other side of that, which is all very well. But uh, how do you defend yourself a year or two or five years later? I mean, the witnesses. All of a sudden, people come popping out of the woodwork. So that really bothers me, too. And, oh, yeah, meet the, the wannabes and the me twos. But it's just a matter of opinion. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Spartanburg, South Carolina. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. Thank you for taking my call. You're very welcome. Hey, I have a friend who is starting up a new business and is looking at establishing it as a common law business trust. And he's asked me to be a trustee for this. Well, I'm not sure what a common law business trust is. I apologize. I'm not either. It uh, apparently is a, a form of business business organization uh, which will provide people with protection uh, as far as rights to privacy and different tax uh, advantages, apparently. I, I must put... What is the name of this? It's a common law business trust. Hey, but I want you to hold on. Maybe somebody can tell us both what it is, because I just don't know. Okay. You hang on a minute. Thank you. If you know what a common law business trust is, you're probably an attorney. Give us a call. Common law business trust. What is it? Number is 703-413-8381. Uh, That's our hotline. I hate that word. It's our health line. 703-413-8381. We'll put this gentleman on hold. And Danny, what else we got here? Oh, my goodness. To Overland Park, Kansas. Have been there many times. Hello there. Great. Uh, thanks for taking my call. I really love your show. Well, thank you. Uh, Bruce, I did some uh, artwork for a business, and they are getting sued. I'm a graphic artist, first of all. I do uh, mm -hmm. commercial illustrations, graphic work, and so forth. I did some artwork for a uh, business, and they were working with another artist before me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see any sketches or preliminaries or anything. They're having some difficulties with the with the first artist. They canned the first guy. Um, they had a parting of the ways, I guess. And, <laughs> they uh, canned the first guy. So okay, I, can't. I guess so. Okay. And he, he, was, he was he was not an employee though. He was just he no, was his a, contract work. Got you covered. And right. now the first artist is coming back and trying to sue them because they say the new guy, which is me, stole their uh, stole the idea. Yeah, and that's... they'll probably do a small claim thing. Am I? If I go, am I on the hook in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, if he, if he sues you. Well, he's not going to sue me. He's going to sue the people that own the own the business. Well, if he doesn't name you as a def as a defendant, I can't see where you're on the hook unless unless then the guy that you're working for turns around and says, "Oop, you did me dirty," and sues you. At I don't know why they would say they were happy with the job. And well, they I don't, uh, putting aside, you asked if your, what your exposure is. Yeah, and it just seems to me right now nobody's suing you. No. Well, and you have no exposure right now. Well, they asked me to go to uh, court. Uh, well, they, they don't have to ask you. They can subpoena you. Well, they, they're just asking me if I'd come along and, and bear witness to the sure. fact that they had a parting of the ways. So. Indeed. All you can testify to is that that you know. Yeah. Now, you know that, that you were hired by these guys. Yeah. Is that true? Yes. And, and they well, told me about oh, the take a, take a deep breath. Okay. okay. You, okay. You, you, know what you, you know that you were hired. Yeah. You know that you were never made privy to, I assume this is the case, to anything the other guy did. They told me what they wanted, but I didn't see any sketches or oh, artwork. Well, well, man, that, you, you see, they could, the other guy contend, well, they, they told you what they wanted based upon what I gave them. You don't know that. No, I don't. I mean, truly, there's no way that you could, you could deal with that. All I know is that Mr. Brown of Brown, Brown, and Brown said he wanted a Framus valve on a snoop, and this is what I gave him. Yeah. I never saw anybody else's sketches. Correct. I, I never just... Well, this, I'm, I'm, th I'm saying this is your testimony. Mm -hmm. That I never talked to the other party, had no idea what he was doing. Obviously, if we were both given the same problem to solve, there could be some commonality in the solution. Yeah. You know, if, if it's, we're doing math and we're saying, how much is two and two? We're both going to say four without plagiarism.
Good luck, my friend. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Common Law Business Trust. Now, what is that? Well, Bruce, I'm driving home holding a pizza, and I'm about as confused... <laughs> I'm about as confused as anybody, but let me tell you what is common in Florida and probably over half of the other states. There's only certain business entities that the law recognizes. You have a corporation, whether it's a C-Corp or an S-Corp. Right. You have a partnership, right. and you have a sole proprietorship. Yeah, there's one more. An individual doing business as. Yeah, there's another in there. Now, when... Hold it. There's another, isn't there? Pardon me? There's another one. Joint venture. Oh, well, there's another yet then, a professional association, which is limited usually to physicians and, well, and medical practice. Correct. That falls under corporation in Florida, but yeah. It's, it's a little different, but it's a different kind of corp, though. If you say PA, that's a different corp than a C corp or a, or a, or a S corp. Negative. It's no? a, in Florida, it's either a C or an S corp, period. If you then call it a professional association, the only difference is, mm -hmm. from the standpoint of corporate law, is that it's a corporation involving licensed professionals. But it's, to the extent that it is that, yes. It yeah, is. it is restricted to the licensed professional. Yes. Gotcha. Okay, now, go. With the, the common law business trust, I can presume, and I can tell you that I spent an entire year studying business entities, but I can presume, having never heard of that, that it stems from a method of association to do business in many years gone past. While it may have been part of the common law, common law meaning from years past brought over originally and formed from England, mm. it is no longer viable today. And were the gentleman to conduct business as a business trust, at least in this state and many, I would gather that he may very well not gain the benefit of the limited liability that he needs or any of the other types of benefits in a corporation. Well, what would the advantages be? I can't think of one because I don't know what it is. Right. Well, you and I are together on that one. I thought I was reasonably there. Now there is a new, there's a new uh, uh, corporate entity too on the scene. It's, and I've forgotten the name of that too, but it's it's a it's some kind of a limited. It's a corp, but it's a it's 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 set up a little differently, I believe. Well, they have. Derivatives like PC in some states. No, no. But that's not what you're talking about. No, PC is generally, you'll, you'll see attorneys under a professional corporation. Right, right. No, this is another another uh, little spin, but it, it's but nothing. But the key here is when the caller identifies it as a common law vehicle, mm -hmm. that's a signal right away that it's, I don't like to use the term archaic, but, but for lack of a better term on the spur of the moment, it stems from historical tradition. And that's always good for history class, but when you get involved in common, everyday business transactions in 1995, and you stray from the accepted and approved vehicles for conducting business, you enter into the gray area, and the only person that's going to like that is a litigation attorney who's <laughs> paid a lot of money to go figure out what it is when it counts. Yeah, when, when, when there's an action. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, well, let's do it another way, though. This, he's been asked to become a... What, director, was it? Trustee. Trustee. Uh, I think for me, I'd tell him, don't do it. Yeah, and not only that, Bruce, in addition to that, even if he were a director of a corporation, I serve as a director on a few, mm -hmm. I require a DNO policy. Absolutely. Or I'm not going to do it. No. Even uh, even in, in the nonprofit areas where exactly people, where, where people you're on the I don't want to pick on a company or, a, or an association homeowners but, board uh, yeah okay classic example there you go absolutely classic example right if you don't have uh, a director's insurance and something goes wrong you in the whole you're on the homeowners board and they got a little, little pool out and back at the clubhouse and somebody breaks their neck look out right you're you're going to be right into the uh, litigation loop. Exactly. And I don't think an insurance company is going to know any more about this type of unusual vehicle than we do. Thus, to get that insurance may be impossible. Indeed. I think it's time to tell your buddy, thanks much, but uh, come back with one hell of a good explanation or forget it. Thank you very much, Counselor. I appreciate it. No problem. And can I speak to your producer on the side? Of course. Danny, hold on. We'd like to keep you on the horn here. We'll take a little time out when we're talking. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. We're going out of Traverse City, Michigan. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. Thanks so much for taking my call. Well, I, I'm very happy you're here, kid. I have a 
problems. Uh, my mother-in-law passed away back in June, and she did not leave a will. There's six heirs. All right, let's, let's, how do you know that? Um, well, in other words, what I'm trying to get to, I'm not questioning you that your veracity or anything, but I, I, you're, you're certain that there are six people under the laws of intestacy in that state. Yes. Okay, talk to me. Who, who did your mother-in-law leave behind? Um, she left behind five or six children. No husband? No husband. Okay. No dead children? No dead children. All right, six alive children. Okay, go ahead. What did uh, she, what, and what is it that she was, what was her, what did her estate consist of? Poor grammar. Oh, uh, it's just a small estate, um, a house, a uh, trailer, bank account, okay. just real and small things. Did someone apply to the surrogate court to be named administrator of the estate? Yes, two of the children. All right, the, and the other four signed off? Uh, no, there was no signing off. Well, they usually have to. Uh, well, this is such a mixed up deal, it's uh, unreal. Uh, why is it mixed up? Uh, everybody is arguing and fighting about this. About what? About the state and how it's been handled. Well, how, first of all, ordinarily, if you apply to the court to be named an administrator, and when somebody is incredibly stupid and doesn't have a will, and that's what it takes, you gotta be stupid not to have a will. Mm -hmm. And that's your mother-in-law in this case, stupid. Yes. Uh, then you apply to the, 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 the surrogate's court. If there are direct heirs, as there are in this case, mm -hmm. ordinarily the surrogate's court will contact them and say, do you have any objection to this person be named administrator? No, that was not done. Okay. <laughs> um, one of the primary, well, one of the representatives has the most to gain, which she had a land contract. By, hold, 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 take it. What do you mean? Who had a land contract? Uh, one of the representatives that's representing the state had a land contract. With whom? With my mother-in-law. Well, that land contract is part of your mother-in-law's estate. Correct. Yeah. Well, she said she could not get the house financed for the amount of the land contract. Well, she doesn't have to. Right. So the children agreed to draft it down seven thousand well, dollars for her. Well, but she could keep the. You understand something? Mm -hmm. If your mother-in-law entered into a contract, that contract is binding on her estate. Yes, this, the, the, this, this other one of the kids doesn't have to do anything. She just keep paying the estate. True. Well, that's don't don't put a true with a question mark. That's true. Mm -hmm. Anything that she does, she's given up something. If she if, and she doesn't have to. Right. Now the kids want her to sell a house. Is that they want to get off money, get their money is what it comes down to. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Well, they they may not be entitled to that, but go ahead. Well, as a favor, the children did lower it to seven thousand yeah. dollars, with the agreement that she did not get her one sixth share of that house, yeah. or any other money that is left. How much is the house worth? Um, I, she got it for seventeen. The land contract was twenty-seven, and she had owed a balance of. What do you mean? She, maybe now I'm all. What do, you, what do you mean she got it for seventeen? Well, the the children agreed that she could have it for seventeen. Oh, they they lowered it to seventeen. Yes. But the price was that. But there was an outstanding balance of how much? Twenty four eight. All right. So in, in consideration for for her getting a lowered contract price. She gave up her rights to the rest of the estate. Is that what you're saying? Yes, but it was only a verbal agreement between the six. Oh, verbal means nothing. Go right. Ahead. I In know. Well, she ended up getting her six of the 17000 All right. And now she is also after her six of everything else. How much is everything else? We don't know. Well, you but, said it was a small estate. Yeah, well, I'll say uh, another 25 thousand the estate yes so we're talking about a six of that right four thousand bucks yeah is that worth having a family squabble over the family's already squabbling anyways they don't get along hmm. lovely <laughs> so hmm. what i'm asking um without spending a lot of money hiring a lawyer to get this straightened out since it's supposed to be a law to begin with that it is divided equally what well, can we do? Well, the, the, you see, on the one hand, 
the uh, and I, I don't want to play a lawyer here. First of all, I'd give her her money if it was me. Uh -huh. It's going to be more hassle than it's worth. You're talking about four thousand dollars spread across the other five people. Mm-hmm. That's eight thousand eight hundred bucks a piece. Right. Well, is that worth fighting over? Uh, apparently so. No, it isn't worth fighting over. You may have some idiots in the family that are saying they're going to fight over, but it's not worth it. Uh huh. Because obviously you could not afford to uh, to hire an attorney for to handle a matter of this nature. There's not enough money involved. Uh huh. Now on the other side of that, you want to be the be real uh, kind of dog in the manger thing. They could tie it up for a long time. Mm hmm. But well, who who benefits from that? Right. Nobody. Right. Seems like somebody who who's fighting with whom now. You got the you got the one sister who got a concession on the house on the the, the seven thousand dollar concession, uh -huh. right? That's the one person. Right. Who uh, now who's fighting? All the other five? Um, half of the five. You can't have half of five, that's two and a half. Okay. Well there's there's three that line up left as it is and there's three that don't. No, there's three and two. The one I'm sure she wants it left as it right. is. Right. You don't count her. So, okay, then there's two that want it left as it is and three that don't. And why do they not want it left as it is? Uh, because of the, uh, you just have to know the family. It's, well, uh, she's just. She snookered them. Yeah. Well, they got snookered. That's the way life is. Uh, the, okay. The, the, here, well, you say, oh, I don't mean to be unkind. Uh -huh. I'm not unfeeling, but to straighten it out. Let me put it another way. If you're sitting there, you're cooking a recipe, right? Mm -hmm. And you got it on the stove and you're making a nice dish and you screw it up a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you, for example, let's say, let's say you over season it. Mm -hmm. Well, there's one way to get around the over seasoning, and that's to add a whole bunch more ingredients and, 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 and water it down, right? Right. Well, that would be okay, but then who needs a 30 pound meatloaf? Right. You see what I'm saying? I see what It's you're cheaper saying. just to chuck the meatloaf than to try to sal. You could salvage it if you put too much pepper in there by adding more ground meat and bread and tomato, whatever goes into your meatloaf. But now you got a meatloaf that that stretches across the kitchen. Who needs it? Mm -hmm. Well, you you have the same situation here. Yeah, with throwing enough money at the problem, it could probably be solved. But are, are these three people willing to come up with three, two or three thousand bucks a piece out of their own pocket? Uh, well, we didn't know how much it would run. Well, if you can you can sneeze in the in the lawyer's office, and you're going to talk about a couple grand. Right. And we're only talking about eight hundred bucks a piece. Mm hmm I'd say, look, she got the better of me. That's what it comes down to. She got the better of him. Uh huh. And she can tie this thing up. And furthermore, I don't understand how the administrators got appointed without those people signing off. But that's another problem. Okay. Thanks but you so know, much. But you know who we have to blame for this whole thing? Who? Grandma. All right. <laughs> She's the one who screwed it up. Uh huh. Let me ask you a question. What's your first name? Jennifer. You have a will, Jennifer? Um, we're in the process. Nah, the answer is no. I know. You're I just know. as dumb as she was. I know. Do you have children, Jennifer? Yes. How old are they? Six. What happens if tonight, Jennifer, tonight, you and the old man get killed in a little field accident? Who gets your kid? Uh, that's one reason that we don't have a will because we can't agree on who gets the kid. Oh, you'd rather have a judge decide, is that it? Uh, no, it's just that we. No, can't well, agree. that's well, my, my well, Jennifer. Don't you understand that if you don't agree, a judge is going to make the decision? Yes, I do understand. And your old man and you can't get along with this one, huh? No, we can't. Who do you want to leave the child to? Uh, probably my sister. And who does he want to leave it to? His daughter. How from old a previous is, marriage. How old is his daughter? Um. 27. How old is your sister? Uh, she's in her 30s. Hmm. He doesn't get along with your sister. Or his, he, well, or, she's not married, so he doesn't think that she would be a good mother. Well, you can be a good mother and not be married. Right. Is, is, is the daughter married? Yes. Does she have children? One. Is she a good person? Uh, yes. Wouldn't you rather have it with her than have the court decide? Yes. <laughs> then why don't you give in on this one? <laughs> I'll probably have to. You're not well, proud, but you see, here's what we're. <laughs> you can see. How old are you? You how old? You must be about early thirties. Uh, mid forties. Mid forties. Yeah. Oh, you're an old one. Mm. I know. I'm only kidding. You could see how much chaos was caused by not having a will. Mm -hmm. And your situation is infinitely more complicated because you have a minor child. Right. Now, given that sort of circumstances, why would you want to repeat history? 
You're right. I don't. I do wish you well, dear. Thank you. All right, Bruce Williams, Bye-bye. hang in for more. This is TalkNet. Orono, Maine. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. Hello there. How are you? Very good. Got a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, I was uh, laid off in, uh, at the end of October. I'm in a management position mm-hmm. and uh, signed a severance, uh, signed a termination agreement for a severance package. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the end of November, the director of human resources uh, wrote a letter to me saying that they couldn't offer me one of the items that we had agreed to and uh, was offering uh, to extend my medical coverage for additional three months. What is six it? months, which I already had. I had already negotiated a six-month medical. Well, and they're going to extend it to nine? No, I offered that. I countered and said, I don't well, understand. Well, back up, back up. Okay. You're telling me that they already had 180 days in there, and now they're offering to give it to you again. Yes, no, no benefit. Yeah, you already have it. I already have it. So what are they, they're giving you nothing. They're giving me nothing and taking me taking what, away. The, what is it they're taking away? Uh, we had negotiated a uh, three-month uh, life uh, insurance continuation for my dependents. And they're saying they don't want to do that. Uh, so after hearing the director's proposal in ri- or reading it, I offered in writing uh, uh, to alternatives. One was to extend the medical from six to nine months um, or uh, offer a additional uh, severance payment of $2,000, oh, which, which was calculated uh, uh, by adding the, the companies and my monthly premium for that benefit. You're telling me that the, the, the seriously, your, your, your life insurance premiums are eight grand a year? Yes, but between the companies and mine. For a life insurance? Yes. Well, how much life insurance for pay sake? And how old are the people? Well, my wife and uh, two dependents. Well, my wife or kid, they're kids, right? Uh, one's in college, the other is in high school. All right, they're still kids, relatively so. <laughs> sure. Yeah, well, yeah, they, you know, the law says the kid in college is an adult. Hello. Anyway, how much insurance? How much life insurance? Are we talking about? Yeah, how I, much face value? How much? Uh, that's a good question. I, I would have to look that up. I do not know. It must be an incredible amount of insurance. Well, I don't. Eight grand can be eight thousand dollars. How old are you? I'm uh, forty-five. Last check. Eight thousand, eight thousand dollars a year. I'll bet you would buy a million on you. At your age. Yeah. Of whole life. Well, the the uh, the value that was calculated was given to me by the company's um, benefits representative. Maybe I did, it just must be one hell of a lot of insurance. So that's the next question. Okay, is everybody in good health and so forth? Yes. Well, uh, is, is it really an issue? Ninety days of life insurance. Unless, unless there's some cash values here. Yeah, that's the cash value that I'm primarily interested well, in. I hate ca- to give up uh, well, I understand a benefit that. without compensation. No, particularly I'm, I'm aware of that, but I'm trying to agree to it. Yeah, but forgetting that up for the moment, we in the, in the, well, let's talk about the realities. How much additional cash value would the policies accrue if they met this ninety day, this extra ninety days? Oh, not much. If that's exactly that's why I think you're fighting over nothing. That's what I'm trying to get to. Well, uh, I understand your reluctance to give up. Don't please don't misunderstand me. But I, this doesn't look like I don't, I don't know why they made an issue out of this because it just seems to me, unless there's something I've missed entirely, if there was someone who was, uh, God forbid, at death's door, that would be an entirely different set of conditions. But other things being equal, uh, I just can't imagine that the that we're talking about. Uh, enough money to get into a real serious quarrel about just the, the additional cash value of three months of insurance. I do wish you well in your new ventures, my friend. I am Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Millions of dollars before he won. Yeah. I guess there, by the time he won that he didn't really get anything. Well, no, he did okay, but he had, but he spent literally millions. There was another fellow that got, it seems to me a pretty, again, the, the, the brightest ideas are, are, are seem obvious after the fact. Right. One of the problems when you build something with reinforcing rod and concrete is that the reinforcing rod weakens because it's ferrous and it gets attacked by water, right? I see. 
Would you agree to that thesis? Well, I had never heard about it, but I'll agree with it. Well, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. You have reinforcing rods. They have rebars. Yeah. Right. Well, some guy said, gee, what, why not just coat them with plastic? Then they, the water can't get to them. They'll last for eons of time. Uh-huh. Well, it cost him, I forgot, I saw the numbers, millions of dollars because the company says, great idea, let's go do it. And they did it. Well, he finally got them, but it took an awful long time. It took years and years and tons of money to get them. Yeah. And then, of course, he got the money back and a lot more. Those are the facts, unfortunately. Well, I guess so. so <laughs> I, guess. I don't think there's a hell of a lot you can do. I'd, I'd wait and see what they did. Yeah, I'll wait and see. It might show up on the market. There you go. And then you you could certainly threaten them and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. I do wish you I do wish you well, guy. Hey, I appreciate it ever so much, Bruce. All right, my Have friend. Have a good evening. It's been a pleasure. Let's go now to Appleton, Wisconsin. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. How are you doing tonight? I'm real well, thank you. What's on your mind? Well, I got a question about business mergers. Uh, approximately 10 months ago, I worked for a company, broke off, and went into business for myself. What kind of business? Uh, industrial power transmission, selling bearings, belts, sprockets, pulleys, that kind of stuff. Boy, that's pretty pretty narrow, isn't it? Yeah, but it's... I don't mean that critically, it's just a... It, I, somebody's got to sell hairpins, you know. That's right. Uh, anyhow, ten, like I said, 10 months ago, I broke off and started that. Well, within those 10 months, the company I worked for received an offer to be purchased. Mm -hmm. They, The person that bought that closed last week. Closed? The, the, the uh, sale. So now there's a new owner for the company I used to work for. Well, in the- Oh, I, oh, I see. Okay. Not closed the business, he no. closed upon the transaction. Correct. Gotcha. Correct. He contacted me today about merging my company with the one he just purchased, the one I used to work for. Merging it into? Make it one organization. So, so he has them. So, so there's two stores in two different cities. See, I'm and in you, a different city And now. you wouldn't be competing against one another. Well, we're competing against each other now. That's I said so you would not be competing oh, against one another. Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. And I guess my concern is, I don't know if I'm just trying to be overprotective. Well, what's he offered you? Let's talk about it. Well, what kind he really of, has, we haven't sat down right, to talk about Well, let's numbers. start out with this. What do you got? You started the company relatively short time ago. Correct. How's it doing? Uh, last month, we actually broke profit for the first time, and every month just keep getting better. Okay, so it's it's doing okay, but it's not gangbusters. Correct. Okay. Uh, what if you, Do you have any assets other than your hard work and that kind of stuff? Uh, we have around 24000 in inventory, uh, the computer, a company truck, that kind Nothing. of stuff. Okay, so let the assets are liquid because clearly you're a brand new company. they gotta be, they got to be current. Right. You didn't buy old inventory someplace. No, I did not. And you get the computers worth literally zip. Basically. Unfortunately, yeah, you have not what you pay for them. They're worth nothing on the used market. Right. Truck is probably mortgaged. No. No, you pay well, cash? No. Well, actually, it is mortgaged because we got a SBA loan to start the business. Hmm, how, huh, lovely. How much do you owe? Uh, We owe around 45 All right. So you're, 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 you're technically bankrupt. Yeah, technically. <laughs> okay. So you really you have an idea is what it comes down to right now. Right. Now, what, have you any idea what he paid for this outfit that he bought? Two million. Woo! A lot of inventory. Huge inventory. Was it mostly an inventory assets purchase as opposed to an accounts purchase? Uh, I believe, I would say the inventory was probably worth 750000 to maybe a million times. Well, let's say it's a million. Okay. What was the other million for? The other million was for the building. How much is that worth? Let's separate it off here. The building? Hmm. Good question. That's probably worth a couple hundred. A couple hundred thousand. I hope we're still 800,000 shy here. Right. Generous. And I'm sure that had a lot to do with the assets of the, or the excuse me, the clients, the accounts. In other words, that's the blue sky. Right. All right. Well, what do you suppose this guy could offer you? Right now, it, it sounds like he wants to have more control of it than anything else. Where I still control have. Control over. Both business, if, if we were to merge, it sounds like he wants to have more control over my business. And I guess that's what I don't want to, I'm, I'm worried about giving that up first. Well, off. Here you're, you're talking about a $2 million, assuming that, the, that that was a good price. We don't, I, I have no way of knowing that. Let's assume it was. Okay. A $2 million company taking over a technically bankrupt company. He's going to have the biggest part of the action. Right. Now, I don't know if it's good for you or not. You Five years from now, you may be kicking his butt all over the street. And that's, that's my concern. I don't want to, you know, five, ten years kick my 
kick myself in the butt because I could have done a lot better. Well, the question is, what do you get today? That's the question. And obviously, we don't have an answer for that right now. If he offers you 25000 bucks, we're going to be ridiculous, right? Right. You say, well, hell with you, Mac. I'm on my way. And we're going to kick your brains out in the marketplace. Right. Now he walks in and offers you two hundred grand. Hmm. Now you got to start thinking, don't you? So he he would af- actually offer me money, not just... Oh, money or stock in his company. Okay. But the question... See, if he offers you enough to tantalize you, that's where the problem lies. As long as he doesn't offer you enough to make it interesting, we have nothing to worry about. If he offer, makes you an offer you can't refuse, that's another situation, isn't it? Yeah, take the money and run, I suppose. Well, but, but it's certainly something you have to consider. Now, one of my concerns is I think he wants to have it so I'm still part of the corporation. You know, merge the two corporations together. We're subchapter S and so is he. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I mean, that, 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 that's this technical stuff. The question is, when it's all done and said, what do you have an interest in and what is that interest worth that's what it comes down to well i guess one of my concerns is uh, is there a way i can stay from being liable for the loan he took out to buy his business well but, but, but i didn't know you didn't mention that i'm told now <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> you strongly, i doubt if it's a corporate loan chances are no but the, but it also if he has a lot of paper out there then his chances of success are diminished to some degree because debt can kill you if things go sour for a time a debt-free corporation can survive you gotta wait to see the deal if he offers you a deal give me a call and we'll talk about it good luck i'm bruce williams for talknet let's try milford connecticut on for size and see what's happening bruce it is i how you doing i'm doing real well thank you okay i have a problem i ordered something through the mail yeah, what, uh, you, what did you order through the mail? It was a spoiler kit for a car. A spoiler kit? Huh? Yeah. All right. Did you order this from a company or? A company out of Texas. Mm-hmm. Okay, I charged it on my card. Mm-hmm. But I did a stupid thing. I paid for it before I even received it. I paid the mm-hmm. credit card company. That's not stupid. That nothing, well. It really has nothing to do with anything. Yeah, but the thing is, um, well, this was over a year ago. Okay. A year ago. Yeah. Go ahead. So since I paid it last year, I've been calling the company trying to get it. You never it, well, back it up never a little bit. Never received it. It never received it at all. No. And you didn't you didn't put it in contest after a month or so. Well, after a month, I called them and they oh. said it was on back order. Yeah. And they never sent it. So I yeah. kept calling them, and they said, and I just eventually said, I want my money back. Well, they stalled you pretty good. Right. And and it's, over, it's over a year now. Oh, yeah, way over a year. Now, then they said, okay, um, we're not we're not doing refunds now. You'll have to wait until uh, it was a month later. And I was like... Who's not doing refunds? They said, oh, we're not giving out refunds right Who, now. No, wait a minute. Who is they? The company. And you mean the company in Texas that you right. do business with? Right. Mm. How much money is involved? It's only like three, about three hundred eighty dollars. Well, that's not exactly chopped liver. You right. Know, you give that away. The problem is, you see, ordinarily with a credit card, you have ninety days to put something in contest. Right. That's what they told me. Yeah. And you might get stretched that to one hundred and twenty, but not to. You can't expect the credit card company to be on the hook for a year. Right. Now, have you made a complaint to the attorney general in Texas? Um, no, well, I, I, would. I, I I called I, there and they sent me a, a thing. A form. I also, yeah, I also called the Better Business Bureau. Wow. And the thing is, I called them tonight, mm-hmm. and they told me that um, the recording said that the owner of the company was arrested huh. for, for mail fraud. Well, now I was wondering. You should told me at the beginning. Okay. You're out of business. All right, but it said to write the U.S. Uh, Postal Service. If um if there's any refunds available. All right, do that. And and you, you I was wondering it. if be... there isn't any. I, I couldn't do anything to him even though he's in nope, jail. Not very much. No. Oh, well. <laughs> in other words, this guy committed just clear committed fraud. Right. Took orders for stuff, and, and you were too patient. And I can appreciate why you might be patient. Mm-hmm. But here we go again. 
you don't do business with companies you're not familiar with, or at least you can't know something about. Right. Now, I buy things through mail. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just today called the company because I I purchased a, a leather jacket that I, I saw advertised in a newspaper. And I, I like the jacket so much, I bought one for one of my sons for Christmas. Right. Doesn't fit. I called them. I, but I knew the company. I mean, I've heard of this company. They're a major company. And they said, fine, did Mr. Williams send it right back and we'll send you a new one. But I wouldn't just call some kind I wouldn't uh, spend a significant amount of money with somebody I'd never heard of. Right. Well, it was uh, the, the price was uh, good. So well, naturally, that was I the hook. I suckered into it. That was the hook. Yeah. How much did that spoiler have cost anyplace else? About five or six hundred dollars. Uh, doesn't that give you a message? Yeah. Oh, I, I learned now. Okay. How I have one more question. Sure, yeah, well, it's, it's an expensive lesson, but on the other side of that, uh, if you remember, it's a cheap lesson. All right, can I ask one more question? Sure. Um, my friend is in the Navy, my best friend, mm -hmm. and he said he can get a VA mortgage for a house. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that what that is to me? Yeah, VA mortgage is one that is guaranteed by the Veterans Administration. After you've been a, in the service, I'm not sure what the, the time requirements are. I bought my first house under the VA. Mm -hmm. It allowed you to go to a bank, and what it comes down to is they would loan you either all of the money or most of the money. In my case, it was all the money. Right. And then, the, But the Veterans Administration guarantees the loan. If they don't, if you don't pay, they do. I so see. the bank doesn't get stuck. They, and um, certain, only certain houses can be approved? Well, there's a limit to the, the amount of the mortgage. And the, and the houses have to be in, in, in meet certain standards in terms of conditions and what, condition or whatever. Do uh, we want to get like a two family house? What, you and him? Yeah, and we want to run out the other side. Mm -hmm. Well, it's possible. It's possible. But you got to wait till he, how long has he been in the Navy? He's been in, uh, he's, he'll be getting out this year, it'll be okay. four years. Well, after he gets out, he'll probably be eligible for a VA mortgage. Right, because he was in the Gulf. So. Mm hmm I do wish you well, kid. All right, thanks a lot. Hang in there, guy. I'm Bruce Williams. Tough to learn those kind of lessons, but they got to be learned. This is TalkNet. Well, hello there, Rochester. Welcome to my world. Hi, Bruce. Um, hello. We filed for bankruptcy in December of 94, um, Chapter 7, mm -hmm. and we went to our meeting of creditors last week, and that all went well. Mm -hmm. And we just found out that we will be receiving a small inheritance, and I was wondering, will that have to be applied toward our old debt? Very possibly, yeah. Okay, because it's... The inheritance is about four thousand, and our our debt was about ten thousand. Well, if it's, so. an, it's an asset. Okay. Had the had the asset been received after the bankruptcy was finalized, that's been another matter. Yeah, it, it already has been filed. No, finalized. Oh, finalized. Oh, you mean see, the, the money that was the 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 the, the uh, legacy is yours now. Is that correct? No, we have not received it. But yet. I mean, yes, but it's been awarded to you, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um. Well, it's just. Kind of, um, who, what, how, somebody passed away clearly. Who, it, um, my husband's grandmother in, and Nove she, in November, and she named him. Well, it was actually his father who was named in the will, but his father is no longer alive. I see. So, no, I, 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 I mean, I'm not an attorney, and you okay. certainly want to discuss this with the attorney that's representing you in the bankruptcy, mm -hmm. but I suspect that that asset is, in fact, a cash asset that, that should go to pay the creditors. Okay. Okay. But you, but by all means, ask your attorney. Okay. I wish you well, dear. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, honey. San Antonio, hello there. Hey, San Antonio, are you there? Oh, hi, Bruce. Hello. Oh, it's an honor to talk to you on the, on the phone. Oh, well, aren't you sweet? <laughs> I'm so nervous, though. Uh, well, I have a question. I, uh, I have an inactive real estate license, and I decided to go back active as a part-time real estate agent. Mm -hmm. And I call two brokers, uh, one I'm supposed to go tomorrow and one next week. Mm -hmm. Do I tell the first broker that I have an interview with a, another broker? Why not? Well, they're not stupid. Well, I didn't know what, what I should do. I mean, I didn't well, want to well, no, well, you know, <laughs> uh, Unless there was something so outstanding about the one guy. If you're, if you're, you're going to be talking to two or three employers, first of all, most employers realize that uh, people are going to be 
for lack of a better term, shopping around. Uh-huh. And that's and that's a perfectly proper thing for them to do. Well, I thought I should be honest with him. You know, Why not? Let him well, know. What, 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 and what possible harm would it do? Well, I just don't want him to say what well, when it, if I ever do, if I decided that I want to go with that broker. I hope he doesn't decide. Well, no, you know she had to, she went to someone else. You know, so that's what I was thinking. Well, are you, <laughs> look, you you have choices in this world. And that broker knows you have choices in this world. Justice, he has some choices too, doesn't he? Right. If he if three ladies come in that day and he only needs he only has a hole for two, what's he going to do? Uh, not hire anybody? Of course, he's going to hire the two. Oh, okay. I wouldn't worry about that in the least. Oh, okay. That's what I wanted to ask you. All right, baby. Good Thank talking you very to you. Much. I hope you make the right selection, kid. Let's take a little time out. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talknet. Let's go now to Front Royal, Virginia and say hi. Hello, Bruce. How are you? I am fine, thank well, you. Well, good. I wanted to ask you, I, I hear you say if you're looking for jobs or things like that, and I wanted to uh, ask you, I have a son-in-law who is living in Brazil with my daughter. Mm-hmm. She teaches English as a second language over there, and she's been there three years. What does he do? Well, right now, well, his profession, he's a journalist. He's from Brazil and speaks Portuguese. Well, it's neat uh, if you're. It's, it's good to speak Portuguese if you're here in Brazil. But what's he going to do? Well, uh, this is the problem. He's. Uh, she'll be coming back next summer. How about him? Well, he's going to come home probably in in March to start looking for a job. When you say home, you well, mean, he's coming back. We live here uh, in Front Royal, which is about home for you. Not. A, I know where. I know where Front Royal is. Well, like that's Route eighty one. Is it or that's right? But uh, but it isn't home for him. It's home no, for you. Well, it'll be home for him for a little while when he comes back until because he's he'll, he'll probably be with us until he can find something. Well, the qu- first question is: Is he can he get a, a work permit? Well, he's uh, my daughter is getting him a green card over there. I don't know that much about green cards. Well, but, that's uh, what he's got to have to work. Well, that's what he's getting. She was getting that. She was in Bern the other day, and uh, she was getting the, the green card for him. To she, clear was the way. In, she was in where? Well, she lives in uh, Neuchâtel, uh, Switzerland, and she had to go to Bern, Switzerland, <laughs> to get him his green card well, he, so, he can I, enter, I, so he can come back into the United yeah, States without her. I thought... Uh, maybe I missed some. I think said she was in Brazil. I thought you said no. Well, she married him. Uh, he was a student of hers when she was teaching in Delaware, and uh, she said, <laughs> "Yeah, this is crazy." I know. It's been, uh, you know this is like you know the broomstick in the closet God. and wear the red beard. No, wait a while. <laughs> I thought you said that they were in, that they were in Brazil. No, no, he is from Brazil. All right, he's Brazilian. Speaks Brazilian, Portuguese. Speaks Portuguese and living in Switzerland with my daughter. No, you never mentioned English. Switzerland up until the, when you well, said burn. I'm thinking, is there a burn Brazil? No, you know, I I thought I had, but possibly I okay. didn't. But anyway, that's where uh, she is. She's been teaching over there for the last three years, mm-hmm. and he's been over there. But of course, he had he's not able to get any. He's only allowed to work something like 15 hours a week, and he's not been able to do it in the capacity of a journalist. He was sending things back to Brazil for a while, but was having a little trouble getting, you know, getting the money out of Brazil to pay for all this. So right now he's done a lot of different jobs, but not really in his profession. So now he's coming back to the States and my daughter will follow. She'll be back next summer when she's finished teaching there. Mm -hmm. So he's sort of getting a head start. And I was calling to see if you have any ideas uh, where he maybe he could start looking. I haven't a clue. What can he do? First of all, does he have an English facility? Uh, Yes. Well, of course, he speaks in Portuguese. I mean, he speaks Portuguese. He writes in Portuguese, but he speaks English. But is he fluent in English? Not as well as he is in Portuguese. He's he's gotten to be very good in his French since he's been in in, uh, Switzerland. Well, that's terrific. What's he going to do here? Well, this is it. He's going to try try to uh, find some place he can work as a journalist where they I can't imagine where. Where? I don't know either. This is what we're wondering about, too. I mean, what has he got to offer? Well... Maybe he could be a correspondent, for example, for, a, a in this case, a Brazilian newspaper or whatever. Okay. Uh, but, but clearly, uh, in order to be a foreign correspondent, you've got to speak the native language fluently, be able to pick up on the nuances, the idiom and whatever, otherwise you're dead. Mm-hmm. If you're an American and you want to report from Moscow, you know, speaking uh, Chinese, not going to help you very much. That's right. You better be fluent in Russian. Mm-hmm. Uh, he doesn't sound real employable to me. No, doesn't sound uh, really good. We thought being in the D.C. area, I guess he'll first start there at the Brazilian embassy yeah. and go from there to see. Well, you can certainly and, talk uh, to them and the trade consulate and so forth. Mm-hmm. 
the name may have a place for him. They well, may not. This, this is what this, I thought if I could get sort of a head start for him and find no. track down some places for him. But uh, I, I don't mean, know. Let's face it. If Portuguese is not uh, a real sought after language. That's right. I'm not in any that does not denigrate it. That's just an observation. No. Well, even in Portugal, the language they speak Portuguese and that's different. From what quite they, differently from Brazilian. Yes, Portuguese, it is. No and question. he can uh, he has Portuguese neighbors and he can uh, certainly converse with them. But it mm -hmm. is different from there. Well, that's what I was wondering. Uh, I didn't know. And I thought, well, we well, should start in D.C. at the embassy. And uh, well, certainly there if there's any place where there's a polygonal language uh, spoken why in this country. Washington, D.C. certainly qualifies, and probably the next qualifier would be New York City, mm -hmm. where the, uh, you have, you know, a zillion languages spoken. But I think with, uh, you know, you, you mentioned he, he writes. What else can he do? Well, that, I don't know. That is really, that's specific. He does, he's done a lot of things in Switzerland since he's been there, but uh, to get back into his vocation is, uh, that's huh? what he'd like to get back into. Well, it. He's a freelance writer. Yeah, he'd like to. What do he you would like to? <laughs> but I'd like to. And, and, and I know. How old? How old a man is this? Uh, I believe he's thirty-five. Boy. Yeah, thirty-five. They they have a baby now, and and uh, of course my daughter's been teaching uh, ESL. She's been in China and all the different places. So she makes out very well teaching. Does she make? Does she get well paid for that? In the foreign country, she does. Mm. Uh huh. She was in China, and then uh, she was been. It's about the second time she's been back to Switzerland. Hmm. It seems like the needs there, you know, for them over there. She does well. You know, she gets paid quite well in Switzerland. Of course, it takes a lot to live there too. I got a feeling maybe he's going to be a super mom. This guy. <laughs> he just might be. Might he is be a, right now. He, he may be a house husband. I, <laughs> he might be. I mean, I, I just can't think of anything offhand. You know, he may be multi talented in some other area altogether. Well, he. You well, know, the let's thing, hope. Let's hope. Well, listen, I appreciate your input anyway. Take good care. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Coming to a foreign country, which is what this is, without skills, uh, well, a lot of people do that, but uh, what they make up for, and there's certainly several ethnic groups that we could point to, what they make up for the lack of language skill, they make up for by putting in 80 hours a day. It's pretty hard to hate people that do that. Syracuse, hello there. Hello, Bruce. Hi. How you doing? I'm uh, doing really first time well. caller. Uh, very excited to talk to you. I've been listening to you for a while, and uh, I know that you give a lot of great advice, and that's why I'm here with you tonight. Well, let's try, my friend. What's up? Uh, just turned 27 a couple of days ago. 27 years old. Happy uh, birthday, I guess. <laughs> thank you, sir. And uh, I'm interested in real estate, getting into uh, buying a piece of real estate, and uh, just wanted to get uh, some feedback from you I'm looking at a, a duplex and I'm wondering you know uh, what things should I be looking out for well, first of all what are you using for money uh, I have about ten thousand uh, dollars right. and I'm going to be using for the down payment and closing costs you, you married single what I'm um, single okay uh, how much do you earn I earn about thirty five forty thousand dollars and how long have you been doing that how are we trying to look? I'm looking at your employment history okay. for a mortgage. I've been uh, employed uh, in the insurance business for about five years. Same company? Uh, actually, two different companies. All right, that's not bad. Okay. Um, uh, you want to buy a duplex to live in it and and uh, well, currently I'm, I'm living at home right now. I'm, I'm can't beat those rates. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm wondering, uh, would it be worth it for me to make it as an investment? I've heard on your show before that you really shouldn't look at real estate as an investment. Let me ask you a question. That's not, no, I never said that. Are you sure? Yes, absolutely. What I've said is you shouldn't look at your home as an investment. Oh. Quite a difference. Real estate can be a very clear investment. Great. But the, I was about to say to you, do you ever have a good apple pie? Yes, sir. Do you ever have a lousy apple pie? Yes, sir. Okay, the same thing is true with any business venture and real estate is no different. There are good deals and there are bad deals. And understand something, when you start buying real estate, it is a job. It doesn't maintain itself. It doesn't handle itself. Either you pay somebody, and more often than not, if you pay somebody, you can't. It's just there's not enough in it. Not enough big there. Yes. If you got to pay a manager fifteen percent, there's. I'm not going to tell you there aren't places where that still is profitable because that would be totally erroneous. But on balance, those deals are few and far between for the small guy. I see. Which means you got to manage your business now. You, we just start talking about what will you buy and what can you buy and what can you expect. Now, multiple housing is the hands-down winner over single-family housing. 
when it comes to investing. I see. Why is that? Because it costs less per door to build a two or three family home than it does to build a single family home. Exactly. And seldom do single family homes rent. Not always, and I've heard lots of exceptions, but more often than not, single family homes will not rent for enough to justify the price. I, uh, my background comes from a, a finance background, um, and I'm thinking, should I just, and I've, I've done pretty well investing to, to get to this point for the down payment. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, should I just take the $10,000 and, and continue what I'm doing? Well, look, I, I, but nobody can answer that but you. Okay. You know, it, you, you have to look for your comfort level, what you enjoy doing, how you want to spend your time, how you want to risk your capital. Uh, there is a, a ton of money to be made in the market. There's a ton of money to be made in real estate. And there's a ton of money. You, you know how you make a large fortune or a small fortune? Uh, well, start, start with a large one. Okay, yeah, exactly. If you make mistakes. <laughs> but I, I, you see, you're asking me, should I go into real estate or should I go into finance or who knows, rare coins, whatever. I, and nobody can answer that question. Have people been successful in all the above and more certainly? Have people lost their hat and you know what in all the above without question? And understand, if there was no risk, everybody would be doing it. To be 25 and getting into the risk business, I'm here to tell you something. I'd kill to be in your position. Kill. Well, thank you very much, sir. Good luck, my friend. Thank you. Jim Harmon is twisting the dials tonight, making all these things happen. Walter Hassett in master control. Randy Meyer is our operations manager. And, of course, the redoubtable Dan Rudd, our producer. Good guys to work with, and you guys have been super. We'll do it again real soon. I'm Bruce Wiggins. This is Talk Day. The telephone number 800 743 800 from anywhere in, on, around North America. Very glad you're here. We're kicking off a weekend. A lot of parts of the country, the weather's a little bit severe. Other parts, it is record highs. My goodness gracious. All we know is the weather is screwball. Screwball. San Antonio, welcome to my world. Good evening, Bruce. Hi. Hi, I'm a first-time caller, so I'm a little nervous. Well, we'll do our best to kind of put you at your ease. Okay. Um, I need your opinion. My husband has got bad credit from a divorce and some mistakes that he's made in the past. And he was given the name and phone number of an attorney who says he can fix his credit bureau report. I don't believe it. Okay, that's what I thought. There are some things that can be taken out of credit reports. First of all, anything that's not, not uh, true can be removed with some difficulty, but it can be done. Let's uh -huh. start with that. There are also truthful things can be removed with, with using machinations, which I don't endorse. Uh -huh. But if anybody tells you they can clean up your credit completely, if it's really stinko, and apparently your husband's is, uh -huh. they're, they're whistling in the dark, and you say, okay. I think maybe we'll, we'll deal with you, but we're going to pay you after the fact. See how fast do they run. How, how much money does this guy want? $500. Middletown, Maryland. Hello there. Good evening, Bruce. How you doing, guy? Uh, appreciate you taking my call. Well, I'm glad you're here. What's up? I've got a uh, question uh, concerning joint ownership, and I'm talking about husband and wife. Joint ownership of what? And I'm just looking at the major things like joint ownership of a car and a home. I hear conflicting advice about whether to put things in individual names. Well, let's, let's break it down. Okay. A, a house, by and large, you don't have any choice. Unless you're rather wealthy, most people have a mortgage. Okay. And a mortgage company is going to require both names on it So to get the, in order to get the paper. Okay. So it's, it's almost academic. Now, the way it is titled is another matter. That's not academic. If you are an estate... That's uh, that's a tenants by the entirety state. All right. That's the way it should be titled. John and Mary Jones, tenants by the entire. John Jones, Mary Jones, tenants by the entirety. That's only available to husbands and wives. Okay. And what that means is, do you both own the house? You each own all of the house together, which sounds like kind of a conflict, doesn't it? Right. But that's what it's meant. It means you each own the entire house, and if one of you dies, the other one has the whole house. Okay. Or goes away in some fashion. Okay, that that's, that's, that's that. the house. Now the car is another matter. Uh, I don't see any reason to have a car in both names. I don't see any advantage. Okay, I can well see that, some, like disadvantages. I don't see any advantage. 
Okay, that's what I'm wondering because if there's no... Okay, let me do this then. If, if you do a single owner, if I own my car single and I die, can my wife, by the fact that she's my wife, automatically have the car? Or What's, she, what is wrong with the will? Okay, is that the answer? Then you put it in the will. Sure. And you have a will that covers it. Well, you don't have to cover the car specifically. Right. You, you, well, let me ask you this. Do uh, you have children? Right. Do you have a will? And we have a will. Do you do have one now? Yes. Okay. Because you realize if, if you didn't have a will, your wife would not get all of the stuff in your marriage. Right. That's I understand that. Two-thirds would go to your children in most states. Right. But if you said your all of your residual estate, meaning that after you know, your bills have been paid and all that kind of good stuff, don't the car be part of that? Okay, so so that that clears it then. Uh, no, no. Wait, 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 let me let me say this too. All right. If you are very wealthy, there could be a, some additional tax by doing it that way. Okay, so if you. But that's not enough to worry about. Yeah, and I'm not the very wealthy, so the joint ownership is no particular advantage. Well, I see no advantage whatever. I can't right. think of any. Okay. That clears it up. I do wish you well. Thank you. Oh, let me see. From Middletown, Maryland, we go to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. Yeah. Bruce, I have a question for you about uh, traveling to Europe. It's have... not a bad idea. Yeah, well, I have an opportunity. It's business-related. Uh, I have an opportunity for a uh, six to twelve month assignment uh, in Europe uh, in one of four locations. What are the four locations? Uh, London, uh, Brussels, Madrid, and Frankfurt. Wow. Uh, it'd be like I say about six to twelve months. It would be. Uh, Let me think about this now. London. I don't know much about Brussels, Madrid. Clearly, you're. I, I, maybe I say clearly. I suppose you could explore this. It would be cheaper to live in Madrid than any of the other places you mentioned. Uh, I haven't really explored costs that much, as a matter of fact. Uh, is there is there a differential built in? Well, there's uh, no uh, housing is is provided. Uh, you know, but my uh, entertainment and things of that nature, obviously, are I'm on yeah. my own. Well, I think you'll find if it's if money is a big deal. That the cheapest place for you to go would be Spain. I, I don't. I don't think there's much question about that. And the most expensive would be London. Okay, uh, I've been to. I've only been over once, and that was in Brussels for a week. Okay. Now, okay. How did you like Brussels? Uh, I liked it very much. All right. Now the other. The next question is language. Obviously, only one of those places speaks English. Right. Is, is that a, is that a factor for you? Uh, that's the only language I speak. Yes. What I'm getting to is that would that be a factor though? Might not be. I, I mean, I, I don't have a... Well, you mentioned you have no language facility other than English. We share that. But the point is, is that a problem? It was not when I was in Brussels. Well, you're only there for a week. Right. Well, let me, maybe I'm asking the question poorly. Let's, from a business perspective, is that a difficulty? Is that a handicap in any way? In the business, it would not be. No. All right. While I'm at work, it is, would not uh, limit right. me. Now, do you have a decent language facility or do you know? George, can you, I have a hell of a time learning language. My daughter picks it up like she was a sponge. Yeah, no, I, I took uh, you know Spanish when I was in high school and such and didn't have any problems uh, picking it up. Uh, I don't think I'd have a problem uh, picking up language if these uh, tapes that you hear advertised are, are worthwhile. Uh, you know, if a person well, I tried them. I didn't get very far. Yeah. But that's another matter. Uh, I just have a, a poor language facility. I'm, it's a challenge I'd love to meet one of these days. Then the next question is climate. Well, I'm I'm from the north, so uh, I guess it would be nice to be uh, in in warmer climate for well, a while. That's only gonna, only one place that you mentioned is very warm. Well, that's Madrid. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, I guess another thing I was thinking about is um, central, you know, central location or something of that nature. I mean, it's not Europe's not huge by any stretch of imagination, but. Uh, um, you know, taking weekend jaunts to you know Paris or other places. Uh, like I said, I've never, I've only been there for the week before, and this is six months to a year. It'd be a good opportunity, I'm thinking, to uh, in the off days to uh, well, see some other places. I don't have a map in front of me. What the most central, I guess, be London, I guess, wouldn't it? Well, that'd be the that'd be the furthest west. I mean, if I'm 
Well, I guess I thought Brussels would probably be more central. I guess maybe it would. I, I, I don't have a map in front of me. Forgive my poor geography. Yeah. I'm not sure that that would be a major factor where I'm sitting. Well, here's another thing that uh, if we can bring into play, um, and this isn't clarified, but uh, uh, I'm interested in doing this with uh, my family. Uh, and uh, that does include uh, two children. Uh, How old? Uh, six and two. Well, the two-year-old is not a factor at all. Mm -hmm. Would you th agree? Right. Two-year-old doesn't know where they. They don't know where they are. Right. And my wife wouldn't be working, you know, during her stay there. All right. Um, my uh, six-year-old would be going into first grade this fall. All right. Good experience for her. Him. Him. All right. I would, by inclination, would be to send them to an indigenous school, mm -hmm. not to a to a uh, an American school. Uh huh. And they will pick up a language in a hurry. Kill little kids pick up language very quickly. That was that was my thoughts too. Whether it's six months or not, I don't know. Yeah, well, and but, but again, I I think that's a secondary consideration. Maybe I'm mistaken. Well, and I guess that's one of the main reasons. There's I guess there's lots of pros I see as far as uh, taking advantage of the opportunity, which is what I'm seeing it as is a big opportunity. Can you think of anything that, that mitigates against it or militates against it? Um. Well, I guess you know it's. Uh, uh, just change, you know. It's uh, what, what's wrong with change? I don't have a problem with it, but we're talking, you know, a spouse and two young children. Uh, well, I guess well, they, well, well, let's break that down. The kids don't matter. They can adapt wherever they are. Exactly, and okay. if you, you know your wife. I assume that she's an adult. Yeah, she's excited about it. Well, then what's the big deal? Yeah, you're right. Now, I don't think the kids they say are consideration. It wouldn't be in my life. I'll tell you that. Yeah, and I, just, and I don't mean that I don't love them or anything. Hey, but hey, guys, we're going somewhere. You ever hear kids say no? <laughs> no. And if they did, does it matter? Yeah, that's Not to me, it wouldn't. That's true. I, I mean, I, as far as the I know, I know what my choice would be for me, but that's another story. That would be Madrid. Huh? You got it. All right. That's, Hands down. That's kind of what I was leaning towards. I guess I didn't know about uh, cultural differences as far as. Uh, um, when I was in Brussels, it was a real international city as far as, you know, there seems to be a lot going on other than people from Belgium. Um, uh, Spain, I don't know if it's as, if it welcomes people as... Uh, oh, I don't think you have that much of a problem, really. I think, you're, I think you're making this much too complicated. Okay. I think the climate is certainly a consideration. Cost of living, since you're taking your children and family, you won't get paid any more money. It has to be a consideration unless you're getting paid an ocean of money. No. Uh, it's gonna. If you were to go to, to London, I can tell you this: it would cost you a whole lot more money to do, you know, to live and see and get about and so forth, than it will cost you in, in, in Spain. Okay. That in itself would be a consideration. No, I agree with you completely there. The client Germany is not a cheap place to live either. We didn't. Even, we didn't give that. <laughs> we kind of wrote them off in a hurry. Didn't we? <laughs> Have a great trip, kid. Thank you. Uh, Rosaria, Texas. Hello there. Bruce? Yes, it is I. It is you? I think it's me. Let me check. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, I'm pitching myself. <laughs> here I am. Yeah. What's up? Yeah, I'm out here in Brazoria, Texas. I'm an artist. Painter. Oh, fine artist. Okay. Yeah, fine artist. And um, a little problem with this um, dealing with putting paintings in the gallery on consignment. Outside and of actually, Texas. Actually, this is the first night I've... I've I heard your show. My goodness. I'm kind of getting into this talk radio, and I'm just getting into it. How old are you? I am... I'm not going to tell you. No, no, this is, I'm asking that for a reason. Okay, well, I'm 48. Oh, my goodness. One foot in the grave, the other foot in the minute. That's fine, because, you know, talk radio is growing by leaps and bounds. Well, it is, and I had to go to Louisiana a couple of times to see my cousin, who was working on my teeth. And, um, and I got tired of listening to music. For some reason, and I turned it on the AM, and I started listening to you and Rush and everybody else. And well, I'm glad you found us. It was great. But we we think so, but then we're highly prejudiced about this whole yeah, enterprise. Of course you are. But this is the first night I listened to you, and you're talking about other other things than political. Yeah, we don't. We leave that to the other guys. Yeah, I talked to your well assistant about some things, but uh, yeah, about some things. Were you were you were you hitting on Dan? Yeah. Were you really? Well, I just, I, I was, it was political. And I said, oh. how come 
you know, it's one nation under God. And yeah. God only charges 10%, but I know you don't. <laughs> no, we don't deal with that sort okay. of thing. And you've talked me right into a corner. So I want you to hold on a minute while we make a little money and we'll get right back together. Fair enough? Take a deep breath. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. I am talking to an artist in Brazoria, Texas. Yeah. Uh, we got a little sidetracked here. What's on your mind, baby? Well, I um, I, I show at a, a major gallery in Houston. Right. But as all artists do, most artists do, they have their paintings there on consignment. I'm listening. Okay. On consignment, uh, you get a different deal on your deductions. What do you mean, your deductions? Okay, all right. I take the painting to the... I, I take. I paint the painting. Okay. All right, take me six months or two months or... A year. Whatever, you take... You, you have a work of art. Yeah. Now what? And then I go and put a frame on it. All right. And then I take it to the gallery. So far, I think we're right on track. And then I put it on consignment. Yeah. So I have a piece of art that is, I don't know... 3,000, 4,000, 7,000. Whatever the number is, it's not, I don't think it's important to this conversation. You've, you've established a price. The the gallery is to sell it at that price. Or, yes. And, and, the then, gallery, and, it, it, and the they gallery, get a PC. Yes. And the gallery does the advertising. Right. They put a, they put an ad for me in Art News. or but Whatever. Well, that's a national magazine. Yeah, but I don't think that, I don't think any of this has anything to do with you. Well, I, they tell me it. Well, you're I right. You're right. I mean, I'm doing my deal. Right. You know, let's, let's, painting let's, the painting, I'm framing the right, frame. Let's, let's, hold on. Let's, let's stop. You provide a product. Mm -hmm. It's it's given to a vendor on consi consignment. Listen please. to me. It, I'm well aware of that. It's given to a vendor on consignment. Yes. If he sells it, he is entitled to a commission, whatever you have agreed upon in advance. Exactly. If he doesn't sell it after a certain period of time, he has a right to return it to you. That's right. And that's the end of it. Unless you've agreed to absorb some of his expenses in the event of a non-sale. Uh, I don't do that. All right, then that's the end of the deal. Yeah, you, what? But, but. But, 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 but what? End, in my studio, I'm painting the painting. So what? It's not, it's not just the brushes and the... You know, I've got to pay for electricity and... What is that, honey, what does that got to do with anything? Well, listen to me. Well, I'm listening. Well, the way I understand it, that the RS only lets me deduct whatever's on that canvas. The frame, the paint. Uh, that's not true, and, Mrs. And that's, not true. that's not true. Well, and listen, that's listen. What they tell Take me. a deep breath. If... You have a studio specifically I have studios. If you have a studio or more than one studio, yeah, specifically dedicated to doing nothing but producing paintings. Yes. You know, you can't have a cot in there where you sleep, you can't have your lover in there living there and shaving, just in there for one purpose. As a business uh production place. No, quite the opposite. That's the way they treat me in Texas. Who treats you in Texas? Well, if I have a cot in there, uh, and I have do have a futon because I paint all night and all day long. The point is, what I'm trying to get to, is if it is strictly a place of business, then the cost of providing that studio is deductible from your overall income before we arrive at what you have to pay taxes upon. But now, if it, listen to me. If it's in your home, that's a different have, matter. I don't have a sign on the door. I don't want anybody coming in there. They only look up. Do you live in there? No. You have a home, separate home? Yeah, I've got two separate homes. Well, just is one sufficient? One sufficient. You have a separate home. Yes. Nothing happens in this place but business. Is that correct? Nothing. I don't sell anything out of there. I just. I want to know what. Oh, come on, you're being very it's difficult. Like a garage. I'm sorry. It's like a garage. I, I don't... A garage in your house or a separate... I cannot sell. I've got a contract with the gallery. Hold I on. I cannot sell anything. Hold on. That has nothing to do with that. All right. It really doesn't. Okay. Is this a garage in your home? No. 
It's a separate garage that you rent just for a studio. No, it's a, it, I, the garage was, I was joking with you, it is a historical building in Houston in the Artist Warehouse District. In and you rent space in there. Yes. And that's Fourth all, Atlantic. now listen, let's, let's not turn this into rocket science. You rent space, you rent space to, to, to build or paint, paint, that's all that goes on in there. Yeah, I just need to get in to another place. I'm sorry? I have no sign front. The signs aren't the issue. I have tours that do come there. Tours are not the issue. Okay. You rent this space to do your job. Is that correct? That's yeah. either a yes or a no. Is a, a yes, my man. Yes. All right. Then that case is deductible. It's a business expense. All right. If you, if you, if you I, I may, I make this assumption that you do this for a living. This is not for a hobby. No. Well, I would like to do it for a living, but I make a lot of more money. Doing what? Well, I, I just, you know, I have to ask the money. Doing what's the what is the source well, of your I have some stocks and bonds and stuff, and I, you know, that my family left me. But this is all you do as for a living, personally. Yeah. Act actively, then it's deductible. Exactly. You have, you have a decent. It, is it because I make more money collecting that's from not, my family? That's, that is not the issue. The issue is: is this is this place used? in the pursuit of a livelihood. And if you can demonstrate that that's the case, it's not a hobby. Well, I can't dis demonstrate it because my other income is bigger than... That has nothing to do with any... Honey, that makes no... Artists don't make any money. <sighs> do you, did you ever sell a painting? Sell... Did you ever sell a... Millions, but they sell from five to twelve thousand dollars. How much? How many did you sell in 1993? In 1990, I, I, I sell everything I could paint. That isn't what I asked you. How many pictures did you sell in 1993? I sold every uh, all 12 of them. Once. You bet. The answer is 12, not all 12. You sold 12. Is that correct? Yes. And how much did you generate in the aggregate for the 12 paintings? Mm. How much money? Oh, uh, jeez. About $20,000. For the 12 paintings? Yeah. That's your gross number. You subtract the cost of the paints, of course, the cost of the frames, all that jazz, and the room or rooms that you rented specifically to paint those paintings, and the net amount is what you pay taxes on. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams. <laughs> this is TalkNet. You're born in Michigan. Hello there. Hi there, Bruce. <laughs> How you doing? Um, that good. lady would never stop talking. Holy smokes. <laughs> <laughs> What's on your mind, baby? Okay, this is the deal. I bought a new car a year and seven days ago. A year and seven days, right? Well, to the... This is important. It gets better. <laughs> okay, uh, we. I drive a lot. Let's let's state that right now. I drive um, at least forty thousand miles a year, if not more. What are you, salesperson? Um, an actor. Okay. You know, and mm -hmm. I, I drive around a lot. I get a lot of work, um, which is good. And um, so, anyway, the thing is, is that. Uh, the first, uh, this is a car that I uh, dearly invested in, uh, investigated. I love these kind of cars. So I buy the car a week later, about, four, well, a week and a half later, about 400 miles. It starts blowing smoke like the car's on fire. It looks like the Batmobile. <laughs> then I jump out of the car. I'm scared. I call these guys, the dealer, and I say, you know, um, you know, it's blowing white smoke out the car. And they say, engine coating. I say, even if it looks like your car's on fire, they say, yeah. So, you know, I, believing in this product as I do, I say, okay, that's, that's got to be it. It happens a few more times than nothing at all. Then in January, with about 20,000 miles on the car, it happens again, and I don't think it's engine coating. I think not. Plus, the guy behind me almost killed me because, you know, I mean, it's literally, it, it's horrible. So I take it to the dealer. They drill holes in the car. They send me home. They do what? They drill holes in my manifold. Yeah, I know. Anyway, they found some oil pressure building up, and they said that's what's causing it. And they sent me home with my two new holes. So then, <laughs> so then, um, it happens again, and I take it back. And then they say it's because I get my oil changed at one of those fast loop places. What has that got to do with it? Nothing, because then eight thousand other million Toyotas have this problem. I'm sorry. Anyway, so then, um, 
so they changed the oil again. They made me pay for it. Then it, it happens again, and and now they're blaming it on me again. And so well, no, wait a minute. How are they blame? What is it that you could be doing? They said I, because I'm getting my oil changed, and it's 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 the oil overfill. But it's happened. I mean, it's, it's not you know it's happened since I bought the car before the oil was ever changed. It, it, it's just the, the the dealer didn't want to deal with it. So I've been in touch with Toyota since January. Mm -hmm. You get go to arbitration. So you know. Now, yes, you can go to the Better Business Bureau arbitration. That's clear. That's what I did. All right. What and happened there? Are, now listen. What they did was they take my claim, and then they say, "Well, we're moving." Because I call them for confirmation and everything else, and they say, "Well, we're moving our files to Washington. We can't give you any information right now." Well, anyway, the car is up to its warranty. It'll wear out its, you know, that 36 warranty. Well, no, 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 it's not true. No, 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 no. see, it's making a new noise now. But, but well, since I don't, I'm not, I haven't driven it in a month. I'm, I'm running well, the car. Why is that? Because it's making a new noise. And if you don't get the new noise checked out before the warranty wears up. Anyway, I have an attorney for this. If you don't get the warranty. All you have to do is make them aware of the fact that you're having the problem within the warranty period. Okay. Even if the mileage goes over, if it hasn't been corrected, it's still covered. All right, because I can't take it in and get checked because of, of the arbitration process. Why is that? Because that's what they say. You can't you, you can't do anything to the car during the time you apply until the time they meet with the manufacturer. It's in their little book. All right. Have you discussed it? Are you expected to keep the car sitting still for a month? Till they get you their know, act I'm together. I'm broke, and I'm. I have a film production in September, and you need a lot of cash for that. And I had, I had money saved, and it's going to the car. So anyway, so I call this lawyer because I'm thinking arbitration has taken 60, 90 days. You know, this is going on too long. And he says, "Well, yeah, but you did sign up for arbitration, so you have to go through with it." And I said, "But their deal is, is if you, as soon as you sign up for this, they have 30 days to take care of your claim." and get the process started mm -hmm. and every and it's been way over the car is sitting in a driveway the better business bureau won't give me any advice on what to do with the car because then they said they'd lose their objectivity and i see i'm calling you because you say get a lawyer and i did and i don't know that he's right do you know what i mean i don't know well, take a deep breath now. okay what does the attorney specifically recommend that you do right now he said go through the arbitration process now, does that mean that you can't use the car at all during that period of time? Well, he, no, he said buy an extended warranty. He said go to back and buy an extended warranty. Will they sell you one now? I don't, I'm not allowed to go back to the people who sold it to me. I don't know that. What do you mean you're not allowed to go back to that? He said they would have, I would be arrested if I went back. They what? <laughs> so, arrested for what? Because I wouldn't leave the dealership without trying to get the problem solved. It's, yeah. not, it's not pretty. And I wasn't yelling. I mean, it... I'm just, you know. What were you doing? I was standing there saying, I, I need to speak to someone. They were going to tell my cops a lot because what I was going to do is, get, I, I need my car to survive in my business if I don't have a car and I, I can't have a car. So what I said was, forget it. I'll get it. Forget arbitration. I'll just get this car checked. But I wanted to make sure by Monday, I want to, to take it to another authorized dealer. Okay. You can have a check. The warranty work can be done at any authorized dealer. And will that affect my arbitration? I don't. I don't know that. I don't think that it will. You're taking it for another matter altogether. This other noise that you described. Okay. Just take it to another dealer. Okay, and then I can just continue driving my car. I don't see why not. <sighs> okay. Well, thank you. I for just. I mean, I could be dead wrong, but I don't think so. I wish you well, sweetheart. Hang in there. I'm Bruce Williams. <laughs> this is Talknet. Let's go now to Lincoln, Nebraska. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. I have a question for you about a cleaning business that I've um, owned and operated for about 10 years now. When you say and cleaning, do we mean cleaning offices, dry cleaning, or what? Oh, it's a cleaning service for, I started out residential, and uh, then it went, I'm doing uh, more um, commercial now. Okay. Okay. And I want to get bigger. Um, I raised a family. I'm single, and I raised my boys doing this. And I'm getting older now, and I don't want to work so hard. I haven't and found anybody who's getting any younger. <laughs> that's right. And I, I would like to uh, get bigger and let some of these, uh, some of my gals work, and I not have to work quite so hard. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to know how to go about this so that it's not only legal. 
Well, what, do you, what would be illegal? Well, I don't quite know what to do. I mean, about the insurance and uh, what I'd like to do is uh, not go um, with uh, payroll. I would like to sub the work out. But I want to do that where it's uh, legal. You know, well, 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 what are you trying to accomplish? Let's start with that. Okay, first of all, I'm trying to accomplish that um, I'm going to get more work. I've got a yeah, but, contract. And but, but, like but, but hold it. Take a deep breath. Okay. What has that got to do with subbing out? I'm not quite sure I understand. Well, I think um, I know what you're getting to. I'm well, not sure why. Well, I, I would like to not have to go through all this payroll. Tax. Honey, that's part of being business. Mm -hmm. You got to have payrolls and you got to take out the Social Security. It's just part of being there. Yes, I, I realize that. But I well, why is that a problem? Well, I want I wanted to get away from that and just sub it out to I have some girls that would like to take over some of my uh, apartment complexes. <laughs> and just sub the work to them. What does that mean, sub the work to well, them? Well, in other words, they would do the work for so much. In other words, instead of me paying them by the hour, I would just say, will you clean uh, these four apartment complexes and uh, I will pay you X amount of dollars. Now, that means they got to all go out and get insurance. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very complicated and probably more expensive. You think so? Yes, ma'am. All right. All right. Well, I guess I work my fingers to the bone forever, huh? No, no. Wait a minute. Now, okay. let's let's examine that. I want what what a yeah, payroll. Let's start with that. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a, one of those deals for the most part. Do as I say, not do as I do. All right. The reason I say that I have several businesses that I own. All right. But I still take an active interest in the payroll mm -hmm. because I have little to do with them, and I can tell an awful lot about what's going on by who's getting paid what. Right. That's the reason I keep an interest in the payroll. Mm -hmm. However, I'm involved in other businesses. We don't have any, we do we do we don't do payrolls at all. It goes out to an outside service. It's not expensive. In other words, uh, contracted out to it on a, a to a payroll company. Through a payroll company. Absolutely. All you do is call them with the numbers, and then they, the messenger comes by with the checks in the mail, or the checks in an envelope for all your employees. They fill out the nine forty ones. They make the deposits. The whole thing. Oh, wonderful. It's, it's on your account number. That's great. Well, you didn't know they had those companies? They're, no, every, they're all over the place. Well, I'm not very big. How many How many employees do you have? Five. Well, probably cost you probably a lot more per employee because it's so small. Mm-hmm. Uh, eh, 30 bucks a week, something like that, 20 bucks a week. 20 bucks a pay period. Mm-hmm. You probably pay every two weeks. Mm-hmm. But you, all you do is just call the information in. How many hours? And they already have the number of deductions that these people have. All you do is Millie Jones, 47 hours. Boom, they do the whole thing. Wow, that's just great. I had never, I never really thought of, uh, heard of that. I really well, hadn't. Well, that's easy. Now, what else, what else do we want to take off your back? <laughs> I'm serious. Well, that, that was a part of the, the, of it. I just didn't want to have to do that. I wanted, I thought that was awfully complicated. And, it's uh, so, five I people, I could do your, I could do your five people payroll in 10 minutes. Well, see, I'm. I didn't want to go through all that. Uh, wait, wait a minute. No, hold on. Only on a minute. Okay. What is so complicated? You have five people. Every two weeks, you sit down and you say, "Okay, they were Millie Jones, forty-four hours. Okay, forty hours straight time, ten bucks an hour, four hundred dollars. Four hours overtime, uh, four hours, ten dollars, fifteen, sixty dollars. So she had now a four hundred and sixty bucks gross." Mm -hmm. Well, Millie, you take a look. Let me see. Millie is single, mm -hmm. and you look at the little chart over there. Four hundred and sixty bucks tells you the federal income tax. Right. Multiply it times seven point six five. I think that's the number. Put zero seven six five on the machine. That's your Social Security tax. If you have a local a, federal, a local income tax, boop 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 down the chart. Five people, ten to fifteen minutes tops every two weeks. Is that a big deal? Well, this is that that isn't the big deal. I mean, what's the big deal? The big deal is I wanted to get away from that completely and just go with them doing their own. No, but you, you keep. But don't that. you real, uh, uh, sweetheart? You just can't walk away completely and run a business. Mm -hmm. now, either you want to run it or you don't. Mm -hmm. But doing a payroll is easy. Very simple. Well, no, I know that part. I just thought it would be what else tax wise. Oh come on! You're looking. You're. You're. you're it, it's nonsense. It is. Yes, ma'am. Either you're going to be in business or you don't. Now, if you want to be in business, there are certain things that you have to do. One, but just keep your customers happy. Well, and with an employee, you fire them. 
if they don't do a good job. If you've got to contract it out, that, uh, it's just it's just not a good idea. Either get in or get out. That's what it comes down to. I do wish you well, sweetheart. My thanks to Mr. Daniel Rudd, doing his usual fine job chatting with you guys. Now, I know it's not easy, and nobody ever said it should be. But you try and do what's right, huh? I'm Bruce Williams. Keep in touch.